Emma Daniels was a seasoned businesswoman accustomed to the rigors of corporate life and the demands of the modern world. Her career had taken her to cities across the globe, from the bustling streets of New York to the tranquil charm of Paris. Yet amidst the constant flurry of meetings and deadlines, she yearned for a respite, a sanctuary to escape the cacophony of her fast-paced life. It was during a rare moment of self-indulgence that Emma stumbled upon the Sedgwick Hotel, an elegant establishment nestled in a picturesque town. Its Victorian charm and aura of quiet sophistication beckoned to her weary soul, and she couldn't resist the allure of its promise, a tranquil retreat away from the chaos of the corporate world. Upon her arrival, Emma was greeted by the warm smile of the hotel's concierge, a gentleman named Mr. Thompson. He was a true embodiment of old-world hospitality, his manner exuding a genuine warmth that instantly put her at ease. Emma's room, room 314, was a vision of timeless elegance, with its plush furnishings and a view of the verdant gardens that stretched beyond the hotel's windows. The Sedgwick Hotel seemed like the perfect haven for Emma, a place where she could escape the clutches of her demanding career and find solace in the simple pleasures of life. The town was a haven of tranquility, with its cobbled streets, charming boutiques, and friendly locals who greeted her with smiles. As the sun set over the town, Emma dined at the hotel's restaurant, savoring each exquisite dish that was presented before her. The flavors were a symphony for her senses, and she marveled at how this quaint town could hold such culinary treasures. After dinner, she retired to her room, eager to savor the quiet solitude it offered. As Emma settled into the plush armchair by the window, a sense of serenity washed over her. The room seemed to embrace her, its soothing ambience a balm for her weary soul. She decided to spend the evening lost in a good book, immersing herself in the world of fiction as the town's lights twinkled beyond her window. Yet as the night deepened and the town grew quiet, Emma became aware of a faint sound that seemed to echo through the walls. It was a soft, almost imperceptible noise, like a distant whisper that teased her senses. She paused, her book forgotten in her lap as she strained to discern the source of the sound. The noise seemed to emanate from the room next door, room 315. It was a barely audible murmur, indistinct yet persistent. Emma couldn't help but wonder if her neighbor had left a television or a radio on, its volume lowered to a mere whisper. As the minutes passed, the noise continued, its soft cadence growing increasingly unsettling. Emma could hear voices, muffled and hushed, as if a conversation was taking place in the adjacent room. Yet the words remained unintelligible, their meaning eluding her. Intrigued and perturbed in equal measure, Emma decided to investigate the source of the sound. She rose from her chair and crossed to the door that connected her room to room 315. She hesitated for a moment, her hand poised to knock, but before she could do so, the noise ceased abruptly. Confused and disconcerted, Emma returned to her room, unsure of what to make of the strange occurrence. She had barely settled back into her armchair when the noise resumed, as if in response to her departure. The whispered voices continued, their tone growing increasingly agitated. Determined to unravel the mystery, Emma decided to knock on the door of room 315. She could no longer ignore the enigmatic sounds that had captured her attention. With a sense of trepidation, she crossed to the adjoining door and wrapped her knuckles against its surface. The noise inside room 315 ceased once more, and there was a moment of silence. Then, the door creaked open slowly, revealing the interior of the neighboring room. Emma peered inside, her heart pounding, but there was no one to be seen. The room appeared empty, its furnishings untouched. There was no sign of a television or a radio, and the whispered voices had fallen silent. Emma's sense of disquiet deepened and she couldn't help but wonder if she had imagined the entire episode. Feeling both bewildered and embarrassed, she withdrew from room 315, allowing the door to swing shut behind her. She returned to her room, determined to put the strange occurrence behind her and resume her evening of relaxation. But the whispered voices refused to be forgotten. They seemed to echo in her mind, haunting her thoughts and refusing to release their hold. As Emma lay in her bed, the sound of the hushed conversation filled her ears once more, as if it emanated from the very walls themselves. Unable to ignore the enigmatic voices any longer, Emma called the front desk and spoke with Mr. Thompson, the concierge. She explained the strange sounds coming from room 315 and requested that someone investigate the matter. 
Mr. Thompson assured her that he would look into the situation, and a short while later he arrived at Emma's door. He wore a concerned expression as he listened to the noises coming from room 315, confirming that there was indeed something amiss. Together they approached the door of room 315 and once again Emma knocked. This time there was no response and Mr. Thompson used a master key to unlock the door and enter the room. The chamber was bathed in a half-light, its curtains drawn to create a dim, almost oppressive ambience. As they stepped into the room they found it to be as empty as it had appeared before. There were no signs of guests and the whispered voices had once again fallen silent. As Mr. Thompson searched the room, Emma couldn't shake the sense of disquiet that filled her. She felt a compulsion to investigate further. With Mr. Thompson's permission, she decided to search the room herself, drawn by an inexplicable need to uncover the source of the enigmatic voices. As she combed through room 315, Emma couldn't find any clues that would explain the strange noises. The furniture was impeccably arranged, and the chamber was devoid of any electronic devices. The window offered a view of the night-shrouded town, its serenity in stark contrast to the unsettling events within. As Emma reached the bathroom, she noticed that the door was ajar. She pushed it open, revealing a scene that she could not believe. The bathroom was empty, but a faint, ghostly whisper seemed to emanate from within, its source concealed from view. Emma stepped into the bathroom, drawn by the ethereal sound. She searched for the origin of the noise, her gaze fixated on the ceiling. It was there that she noticed an air vent, its metal grill partially dislodged. With a sense of trepidation, Emma removed the grill and peered inside. To her astonishment, she discovered a hidden chamber within the walls of the hotel. The space was cramped, its walls lined with ancient decaying manuscripts and journals. As Emma retrieved the writings, she realized that they were diaries, accounts of long-forgotten guests who had stayed in the room. The pages were filled with cryptic entries, describing the same whispered voices that she had heard, the same conversations that had haunted her. It became clear that the voices were not a figment of her imagination. The diaries revealed that countless guests had reported similar experiences, and the room itself had gained a sinister reputation. The writings spoke of an inexplicable presence, a voices that seemed to transcend time and space. Emma couldn't help but be captivated by the diaries, their words drawing her deeper into the enigma of Room 315. As she continued to read, she discovered that the room had been the site of unexplained phenomena for decades, with guests reporting whispered voices, shadowy apparitions, and a sense of being watched. Intrigued and unnerved, Emma returned to her room, the diaries in hand, and shared her discoveries with Mr. Thompson. The hotel staff had been unaware of the hidden chamber within the walls, and the revelation left them with a sense of unease. Together, Emma and Mr. Thompson decided to conduct a thorough investigation into the history of Room 315. They sought out local archives, delving into the town's past in search of answers. What they uncovered was a chilling tale of tragedy and unexplained occurrences. Room 315 had once been part of a grand mansion that had stood on the hotel's grounds. The mansion had been the residence of a wealthy family, the Howards, who had lived there in the late 19th century. The family had been known for their reclusive nature and had rarely been seen in the town. As Emma and Mr. Thompson delved deeper into the history of the Howards, they discovered that the family's isolation had been shrouded in mystery. Rumors abounded that they had been involved in arcane practices and had been consumed by a sense of foreboding. The diaries penned by various guests who had stayed in room 315 over the years revealed a recurring theme. They spoke of whispered voices and the sensation of being watched, as if the room itself held a dark presence. The enigma of room 315 had endured for generations, a haunting legacy that continued to bewilder and terrify those who entered its walls. It was as if the room had become a repository of the past, a place where the voices of the Howards and their unexplained secrets continued to echo. The hotel staff decided to seal off room 315, no longer allowing guests to stay there. Emma returned to her room, the diaries a testament to the enigmatic history of the Sedgwick Hotel. As she lay in her bed, she couldn't help but wonder about the countless guests who had been lured by the whispered voices of room 315 and the secrets that continued to elude understanding. The End Story 2 The small town of Willowbrook had always been a place shrouded in mystery 
tucked away in a remote corner of the countryside, it had a history rich with tales of unexplained phenomena and lingering secrets. It was in this enigmatic town that Sarah and Daniel had decided to spend a quiet weekend at the Willowbrook Hotel, a charming and rustic inn nestled among ancient oaks. The couple had come to Willowbrook in search of respite, a break from their busy lives in the bustling city. Sarah, with her fiery red hair and an insatiable curiosity, had a passion for history and a fascination with the unexplained. Daniel, on the other hand, was a pragmatic man, a software engineer who relied on logic and reason. The Willowbrook Hotel was a charming relic from another era, with creaking floorboards, antique furniture, and an air of nostalgia that enchanted its guests. It was rumored to have been a former convent and had a history dating back over a century. The hotel had been beautifully restored, and the couple found themselves enchanted by its timeless charm. Their first evening in Willowbrook was filled with the aroma of the nearby forest and the gentle hush of the river that wound its way through the town. They dined at the hotel's restaurant, savoring local delicacies, and then retreated to their room, which exuded an old-world charm. As the night settled in, Sarah's curiosity got the best of her and she couldn't resist delving into the history of the hotel. She had read that there were whispers of a ghostly nun who was said to wander the halls at night, a figure from the hotel's mysterious past. Although Daniel dismissed the idea as mere folklore, Sarah couldn't help but be intrigued. Their room was adorned with an antique mirror, a relic from the convent's days. Sarah examined it closely, her reflection mingling with the hotel's rich history. She was convinced that she could see faint, ghostly images in the mirror, figures from a bygone era. Daniel, however, attributed it to the play of light and shadow. The night passed peacefully, and the couple awoke to the gentle rays of the morning sun streaming through their window. They spent the day exploring the town, taking leisurely walks through the lush woods, and enjoying the local cuisine at a nearby cafe. Willowbrook seemed to have an undeniable charm, and they were grateful for their escape from the city's bustling chaos. As the day turned into evening, the couple returned to the hotel, their footsteps echoing in the empty hallway. They had decided to spend the evening in their room, enjoying a quiet dinner in the comfort of their quarters. The sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows in the dimming light. It was while they were dining that the first unusual occurrence took place. The lights in their room flickered and then dimmed, casting the chamber in a dark twilight. Sarah dismissed it as an electrical glitch, but a sense of disquiet settled over Daniel. The couple decided to retire for the night, the light of a single lamp illuminating their path. As they settled into bed, they couldn't shake the feeling that they were not alone. It was as if the room held a silent, watchful presence, and the air seemed charged with an unspoken history. Sarah, still intrigued by the tales of the ghostly nun, suggested conducting a seance, a playful attempt to connect with the past. She lit a few candles, and they held hands, closing their eyes. The room was filled with an expectant silence, broken only by the soft murmur of the nearby river. Suddenly, the candles flickered and extinguished, plunging the room into darkness. An icy breeze seemed to sweep through the chamber, and the couple felt a strange presence enveloping them. Sarah's curiosity had quickly given way to fear, and she urged Daniel to stop the seance. The room seemed to respond, and the lights flickered back to life. Despite their unease, the couple attributed the bizarre experience to their imagination, heightened by the stories they had heard. They decided to sleep, hoping for a more peaceful night, but their night was anything but peaceful. As they lay in bed, a soft, ethereal voice filled the room. It was a whisper, barely audible but unmistakably present. The words were garbled like a forgotten language, and the voice seemed to resonate from the walls themselves. Sarah and Daniel exchanged nervous glances, their unease deepening. They couldn't pinpoint the source of the voice, and the air seemed charged with an otherworldly energy. As the whispering continued, it seemed to grow louder and more insistent. Suddenly, a shadowy figure materialized at the foot of their bed. It was a nun dressed in an antiquated habit, her face obscured by a veil. She was a phantom from the past, her form translucent and wavering. The couple watched in paralyzed horror as the ghostly figure extended a bony hand towards them. 
In a panic, Sarah and Daniel fled from their bed, their hearts pounding with terror. They rushed out of their room and into the hallway, their breathless flight taking them deeper into the hotel's ancient corridors. The corridor was poorly lit, and the flickering sconces cast mysterious shifting shadows. The couple found themselves in a labyrinth of hallways, their sense of direction muddled by the hotel's convoluted layout. The oppressive air seemed to close in around them and the echoes of their footsteps reverberated through the silence. As they ventured further into the hotel, they encountered more spectral figures, each one a silent sentinel from the past. The ghostly nuns seemed to glide through the walls, their presence hauntingly real. The couple's fear was now mingled with a growing sense of disorientation. In the distance, they heard a soft, mournful chant, a haunting melody that seemed to beckon them. The voice, a chorus of ethereal nuns, echoed through the hallways, leading them deeper into the hotel's enigmatic heart. Sarah and Daniel couldn't resist the call, their curiosity overpowering their fear. They followed the haunting melody, their footsteps guided by an unseen force. The walls themselves seemed to pulse with a forgotten history, a narrative of secrets and regrets. The chant led them to a grand chamber, a place that seemed untouched by time. The room was bathed in a soft, ethereal light, and the walls were adorned with faded frescoes. At the center of the chamber stood a large, ornate mirror, its surface reflecting the ghostly figures that filled the room. The spectral nuns surrounded the mirror, their veiled faces turned towards its surface. As the couple watched in astonishment, the mirror seemed to come to life. Images from the past flickered across its surface, a montage of moments frozen in time. The mirror revealed the history of the convent, a tale of devotion and despair. It showed the nuns' lives, their dedication to their faith, and the sorrow that had enveloped them. The haunting images left an indelible mark on the couple, who now understood the hotel's dark secret. As the mirror's visions faded, the spectral nuns turned towards Sarah and Daniel, their gaze filled with a profound sadness. The couple could feel the weight of the nuns' unspoken stories, their presence a testament to a past that refused to be forgotten. The chant reached its crescendo, and the room seemed to vibrate with an otherworldly energy. Sarah and Daniel were caught in a maelstrom of history, their own lives entwined with the enigmatic past of the Willowbrook Hotel. In an instant, the room returned to its silent, timeless state. The spectral nuns faded into the walls, and the chamber fell into a profound stillness. The couple, their fear replaced by a sense of wonder, felt a deep connection to the hotel and its unexplained mysteries. They returned to their room and as they lay in bed, they couldn't help but reflect on the events of the night. The enigmatic past of the Willowbrook Hotel had revealed itself, and the couple had become a part of its enduring history. The next morning as they checked out of the hotel, they couldn't help but feel a sense of gratitude for their encounter with the spectral nuns. The experience had left an indelible mark on them, a reminder that some places held secrets that were meant to be shared with those who dared to seek the unknown. As they left Willowbrook behind, they carried with them a newfound appreciation for the mysteries of the world, and the knowledge that sometimes the most profound experiences could be found in the unlikeliest of places. The small town had revealed its enigmatic heart to the couple, and they would forever be bound by the echoes of the past. The End Story 3 The Royal Crescent Hotel was a beacon of luxury and charm in the heart of the city, a place where history and opulence intertwined to create an experience like no other. As I entered the lobby of the Grand Hotel, I felt a sense of privilege wash over me. I was about to embark on a weekend getaway, a respite from the daily grind, and I had chosen the Royal Crescent for its reputation of being a sanctuary in the bustling metropolis. The concierge, a gentleman by the name of Robert, greeted me with a warm smile. He had the air of someone who had served the hotel for decades, and I had no doubt that his knowledge of the Royal Crescent's history rivaled any historian's. My room, room 417, was a masterpiece of classic elegance. The decor was a seamless blend of traditional and contemporary, and a large window framed a breathtaking view of the city. The city light spread out like a sparkling tapestry, and I was eager to immerse myself in the luxurious comfort that the Royal Crescent promised. That first evening, I decided to explore the city. The streets were alive with energy, 
the cacophony of traffic and the hum of conversations filling the air. I roamed the city's bustling markets, indulging in street food and reveling in the vibrant life that surrounded me. The night was filled with laughter, the harmonious blend of languages, and the sweet melodies of street musicians. It was well past midnight when I returned to the Royal Crescent, and the hotel's lobby had transformed into a haven of tranquility. The creepy space exuded an air of timeless elegance, and the concierge, a gentleman named Mr. Lawrence, greeted me with a polite nod. The fourth floor, where room 417 was located, was quiet as I made my way down the corridor. The plush carpeting muffled my footsteps, and the sconces that lined the walls cast elongated shadows. It was as if the corridor had slipped into another era, one where time moved at a slower pace. As I approached the door to room 417, I noticed something unusual. The brass plaque, which typically displayed the room number, was blank. It was as if the room didn't exist, or it was intentionally concealed. The sight sent a cold feeling down my back, but I attributed it to a quirky detail of an old hotel. Turning the handle, I entered the room ready to unwind and savor the comforts of the Royal Crescent. However, the atmosphere within the room was unnaturally cold. I checked the thermostat, which was set at a moderate temperature. Yet the chill persisted. I couldn't help but wonder if the old building had heating issues. I decided to draw the heavy curtains to take in the city's magnificent view. But they refused to budge. It was as if they were frozen in place, resisting my efforts to reveal the world outside. I tugged at them with increasing frustration, but they remained immovable. The room's atmosphere was growing increasingly oppressive and I made my way to the bathroom, hoping to freshen up and shake off the discomfort. However, when I turned on the faucet, icy water rushed out, sending an electric shock through my fingers. I quickly turned it off, bewildered by the unexpected frigidity. I began to wonder if there was an issue with the hotel's plumbing. My discomfort was deepening and I contemplated calling the front desk for assistance. However, when I picked up the phone on the bedside table, there was no dial tone. It was as if the room existed in a state of isolation, disconnected from the rest of the hotel. I decided to leave room 417 and speak with the concierge about the peculiarities I had encountered. As I approached the door, however, I hesitated. The brass plaque, previously blank, now bore an inscription, Room 417. The sight was bewildering as if the room's identity had been in a state of flux, its existence uncertain. With a trembling hand, I opened the door, only to be met with a sight that would haunt my dreams for years to come. The room had transformed into a creepy chamber that bore no resemblance to the luxurious quarters I had entered. The wallpaper, once adorned with classic patterns, was now faded and peeling. The ornate furniture was replaced by drab, threadbare pieces, and the grand window that had framed the city's beauty was now veiled by heavy, moth-eaten curtains. I couldn't comprehend the change that had overcome Room 417. It was as if I had been transported to a different era, a shadowy reflection of the Royal Crescent's past. My confusion gave way to a growing sense of dread, and I had the overwhelming urge to flee the room. Yet as I turned to leave, the door swung shut with a resounding thud. I was trapped my heart racing as I struggled to open the door once more. It refused to yield, as if it were sealed against any attempt at escape. The room's temperature plummeted further and a frigid breath seemed to emanate from the walls. I was engulfed by a sensation of suffocation, as if the very air had thickened with an otherworldly chill. The mirror in the bathroom, once a reflection of my own self, now bore a sinister visage. My reflection was marred by a grotesque distortion, the face in the glass twisted into a rictus of agony. As I stared at the contorted image, a voice, faint and distant, began to emanate from the walls. It was a chorus of whispers, indistinct yet unmistakably sinister. The words were garbled, their meaning lost in the cacophony, but the malevolence of the voices was undeniable. My fear reached a crescendo and I pounded on the door, desperate to escape the nightmarish confines of room 417. The air itself seemed to constrict around me, squeezing the breath from my lungs. And then, as suddenly as it had all begun, it ceased. The door swung open, the room returned to its previous state of elegance, and the frigid atmosphere dissolved. I stumbled out of the room, my pulse still racing, and made my way to the lobby. 
The night concierge, Mr. Lawrence, looked at me with concern as I recounted my ordeal. He listened patiently, his expression tinged with a mixture of sympathy and disbelief. When I asked about room 417, he hesitated before providing a response. He explained that the room had a notorious history within the hotel, one that had confounded guests and staff for generations. No one had ever been able to explain the enigma of room 417, a place where reality and illusion seemed to intermingle. As I left the Royal Crescent Hotel, I couldn't help but wonder about the countless others who had fallen victim to the room's sinister grasp. Its mysteries remained unsolved and its enigma endured, a chilling reminder that some secrets are meant to remain buried, hidden behind the walls of room 417. Over the years, I heard whispers of others who had encountered the room's scary transformation. Each account varied in detail, but the core experience remained the same. The room's sinister metamorphosis, the chilling voices, and the sense of entrapment. The enigma of room 417 continued to haunt the Royal Crescent, defying explanation and perpetuating its legacy of terror. The city's elite and curious alike would continue to check into the Royal Crescent, each guest tempting fate as they crossed the threshold of room 417. The room, with its history of enigmatic horrors, remained a dark secret within the Grand Hotel, a place where reality blurred with the supernatural, and where the line between the living and the dead grew thin. Working the night shift at an old small-town museum had always been a strange and solitary experience. The hallways were lined with dusty exhibits, their silhouettes casting long, unsettling shadows. On most nights, the silence of the museum was broken only by the occasional creak of the wooden floors and the distant hum of a malfunctioning air conditioning system. But one night, as I soon discovered, held something far more sinister beneath its seemingly mundane surface. I had been the night security guard at the Hamilton Historical Museum for years, tasked with keeping watch over the priceless artifacts and ensuring the security of the building. It wasn't a glamorous job, but it paid the bills and the quiet nights allowed me time to work on my novel. One particular evening, as I settled into the monotonous routine of my shift, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. The usual stillness of the museum felt different. I checked the locks on the main entrance, but they were secure. I dismissed the feeling as mere paranoia, a side effect of the solitude of the night. As I made my rounds through the museum, my flashlight beam danced over the glass display cases, revealing a treasure trove of antiques and relics. Ancient weapons, old photographs, and delicate porcelain figurines seemed to watch me as I passed. I couldn't help but feel that the artifacts held stories of their own, secrets that the passage of time had failed to erase. One exhibit in particular drew my attention. It was a display of Victorian-era dolls, their porcelain faces frozen in a lifelike expression. The dolls had always unnerved me, and I never lingered near them for long. However, on this night I noticed something unusual. One of the dolls had shifted position, its porcelain head now turned to face me. I approached the display, my heart pounding. I had been the only person in the museum all night, and I was certain I had locked up securely. But there it was, the doll, its tiny, lifeless eyes seemingly following my every move. I reached out to examine the doll, my fingers trembling. As my hand brushed against the cold porcelain, I noticed a faint scratching sound coming from within the exhibit. I swung my flashlight around, but there was nothing to explain the noise. My unease grew as I continued my rounds, the sensation of being watched lingering at the edge of my consciousness. The more I investigated, the more unsettling discoveries I made. In the natural history section, the stuffed animals seemed to have shifted position, their glassy eyes appearing more animated than usual. I dismissed it as a trick of the light and a result of my imagination. However, the creeping feeling of being watched never left me. I couldn't help but glance over my shoulder, half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows. The museum, once a place of quiet solace, had become a source of unrelenting paranoia. The night wore on and I returned to my desk in the security office to catch up on some writing. I had always been an aspiring novelist and the quiet nights at the museum provided the perfect backdrop for inspiration. But that night, the words eluded me. I couldn't focus, my attention continually drawn to the ambience of the museum. 
At around 2 a.m., as I sat staring at a blank page, the museum's old grandfather clock chimed loudly from the adjacent hallway. The sudden, unexpected sound startled me. I got up and approached the clock, wondering how it could have possibly chimed on its own. It was a mechanical clock not connected to any electrical system. As I examined the clock's intricate gears, the scratching sound from earlier returned. It was now louder, more insistent. I followed the noise down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. The source of the scratching was coming from a small, nondescript door that led to the basement. The door, typically locked at night, was now slightly ajar. I couldn't explain how the door had come open, but my sense of unease deepened. With cautious trepidation, I pushed the door open and descended the creaky stairs into the dark basement. The overhead light was dim, casting long, mystic shadows on the walls. The scratching sound grew louder as I descended further into the basement. It was coming from behind an old, dusty curtain that separated a storage area from the rest of the basement. I approached the curtain and cautiously pulled it aside. What I saw made me grasp for air. Huddled in a corner was a homeless man, his eyes wide with fear, his clothes tattered and filthy. He clutched a small, worn-out notebook and scribbled furiously in it with a shaky hand. The room smelled of decay and desperation. I took a step back, my mind racing with questions. How had he entered the basement, and why was he here in the museum at this hour? The homeless man appeared to be incoherent, muttering to himself as he continued to write in his notebook. Are you okay? I asked, my voice trembling. The man's head snapped up and his eyes locked onto mine with an intensity that made my blood turn cold. They're coming, he whispered, his voice hoarse. They're always coming and I have to document it. You mustn't let them in. I couldn't make sense of his words, and the feeling of unease deepened. I took a step closer, trying to offer help. But the man recoiled, his eyes filled with terror. They're watching, he said, his voice growing louder. You can't trust anyone, not even yourself. Before I could respond, he bolted from the corner and disappeared into the darkness of the basement. I called out to him, but he was gone, leaving behind his notebook, open on the ground. Curiosity got the better of me and I picked up the notebook, my hands trembling. The pages were filled with rambling, cryptic notes, sketches of strange symbols, and frantic scribbles about being watched and the need to document everything. It was a chaotic, nightmarish diary of someone who had lost touch with reality. I had a million questions, but no answers. Who was this man? And what had brought him to the museum? What had he meant by, their coming? As the night dragged on, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The homeless man's ominous warning echoed in my mind, and I couldn't help but wonder if there was more to the museum than met the eye. The sense of unease had escalated into a full-blown paranoia. Around 3 a.m., I made my way back to the security office, intending to call the authorities about the intruder. But the moment I picked up the phone, a chilling sound filled the room. A soft, melodic hum that seemed to emanate from the museum itself. I turned to look out into the hallway, and there, standing in the dim light, was a group of people. They were dressed in black, their faces obscured by masks. They moved silently, in perfect unison, as if they were part of some ritual. My heart raced as I watched the bizarre spectacle unfold. The group of masked figures moved in a circular formation, their movements fluid and graceful. It was a surreal, otherworldly performance. I couldn't explain what I was witnessing and I couldn't tear my eyes away from the haunting scene. The humming sound grew louder, filling the air with a hypnotic melody. And then, with a sudden jerky movement, the group of figures raised their arms in unison and pointed toward me. The sight sent a jolt of terror through my body, and I stumbled back, my pulse racing. I dropped the phone and fumbled for the door to the security office, desperate to escape the nightmarish scene but the door was stuck and I couldn't get it open. The humming sound grew louder and the masked figures continued to point in my direction. I was trapped, surrounded by the enigmatic performance. The sense of dread deepened as I realized that the homeless man's warning had come true. I was being watched and I had no way to escape. As the figures closed in, their masks devoid of expression, I couldn't help but wonder what their intentions were and what secrets the museum held. The night shift had taken a surreal, nightmarish turn, and I was left with an overwhelming sense of dread, my every instinct screaming at me to run, to escape the bizarre, sinister spectacle unfolding before my eyes. 
But the figures advanced, their hands reaching out, and the world around me began to warp and distort. It was as if reality itself had become unhinged, and I was trapped in a waking nightmare, a place where the boundaries between the mundane and the inexplicable had blurred and twisted. And as the figures closed in their masks a chilling mask of indifference, I couldn't help but wonder if I would ever escape the enigmatic grip of the night shift, if I would ever uncover the truth behind the museum's eerie and unsettling mysteries. Story 2 Working the night shift in a small research facility was always a creepy experience. The building was situated on the outskirts of town, surrounded by dense forest and far from the comforting glow of the city lights. As a laboratory assistant, I had grown used to the solitude of the night, but one particular night would forever change the way I viewed the facility. My shift began like any other. The research facility specialized in studying rare plants and their potential medicinal properties. Most nights, the silence was broken only by the soft hum of the air conditioning system and the distant chirping of crickets. But that night was different. As I made my rounds, checking on the various experiments, I noticed something odd. In one of the isolated containment chambers, a peculiar plant had grown much larger than it should have. It was a rare species known as Luminaris, with phosphorescent leaves that emitted a soft, eerie glow. But this plant had exceeded its normal size and now filled the chamber. I approached the containment chamber. My curiosity peaked. The soft green glow of the Luminaris leaves cast a surreal, almost otherworldly light on the surroundings. I reached out to touch the leaves, but before my fingers could make contact, a voice behind me said, Don't touch it. Startled, I spun around to see Dr. Eleanor Weber, the head researcher. She was known for her reclusive nature and rarely ventured into the facility during the night. Her face was pale, and her eyes held a mixture of fear and fascination. What's going on, Dr. Weber? I asked, bewildered by the strange occurrence. Why has this plant grown so large? She didn't answer immediately, her eyes fixed on the Luminaris. Finally, she spoke, her voice barely more than a whisper. It's not just the size, it's the rate of growth. I've never seen anything like it. We both watched in silence as the luminaries continued to expand, its leaves pulsating within strange light. Dr. Weber's fear was palpable, and I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. As we left the containment chamber, she explained that the luminaries had been a subject of intense research for years. Its unique properties made it a potential game-changer in the pharmaceutical industry, but its cultivation was notoriously difficult, with growth rates measured in millimeters over months not inches and hours. Dr. Weber believed that something extraordinary had occurred, something beyond our comprehension. She was determined to find answers, and as the night progressed, we delved deeper into the anomaly. Our investigation led us to the main research lab where the Luminaris seeds were stored. To our shock, the seeds had begun to germinate, their tiny shoots pushing through the soil. It was as if an invisible force was propelling their growth. Dr. Weber took a sample of the anomalous plant, and we returned to her office to examine it under the microscope. What we discovered was beyond belief. The plant cells showed signs of accelerated growth, as if they had been subjected to some unknown force. As the night wore on, we became increasingly absorbed in our research, forgetting about the time. The Luminaris anomaly was unlike anything we had ever seen, and it held a dark, magnetic allure. At around 3 a.m., while we were engrossed in our research, a low, guttural sound echoed through the facility. Dr. Weber and I exchanged worried glances. The sound was unnatural, a discordant blend of whispers and growls. We decided to investigate, following the sound to its source. It led us to a remote section of the facility that housed the staff quarters. As we approached, the strange noises grew louder and more unsettling. It was as if the building itself was alive with a sinister presence. Inside one of the quarters, we discovered a horrifying scene. The room had been torn apart, furniture scattered, and the walls were covered in strange symbols. At the center of the room was the facility's janitor, Mr. Ramirez. He was huddled in a corner, his eyes vacant, and he muttered incoherently. Dr. Weber tried to speak to him, to understand what had happened, but Mr. Ramirez's words were a nonsensical jumble. He kept repeating the word growth over and over. We called for security and Mr. Ramirez was escorted from the facility. 
but the sense of dread remained. The mysterious anomaly of the Luminaris and the strange events of the night had left us all deeply unnerved. We returned to the main lab, determined to find answers. As we examined the Luminaris sample, Dr. Weber made a chilling discovery. The plant cells were mutating, merging with other organisms in ways that defied the laws of nature. The more we delved into the research, the more we realized that we were dealing with something far beyond our understanding. Dr. Weber's fascination had given way to fear, and I couldn't help but feel that we had stumbled upon something malevolent. We worked through the night, our research becoming increasingly frantic as the luminaries continued to grow and mutate. The sounds that had plagued us earlier had returned, filling the facility with a sense of foreboding. At around 4 a.m., as we reached a breakthrough in our research, a blinding flash of light filled the lab. We shielded our eyes, stumbling back in shock. When the light subsided, we were met with an astonishing sight. The Luminaris had grown to an enormous size, its leaves stretching out like dark, outstretched hands. It pulsed within green light, filling the lab with an otherworldly glow. Dr. Weber and I exchanged horrified glances. The Luminaris had become a monstrous, mutated entity, its presence dominating the room. It was as if it had absorbed the very essence of the facility. We tried to retreat to escape the nightmarish scene, but the door to the lab had become sealed shut. Panic set in as we realized we were trapped with the abomination. The Luminaris leaves seemed to reach out, as if they had a mind of their own. We fought to break free, our desperate struggles doing little against the overwhelming power of the Luminaris. The plant seemed to pulse with malevolence, its unnatural growth spiraling out of control. As the luminaries closed in, the facility itself seemed to come alive, the walls shifting and contorting as if they were part of some grotesque living organism. The guttural sounds grew louder, filling the air with a cacophony of whispers and growls. Dr. Weber and I clung to each other, our fear mounting as the monstrous plant closed in. It was as if we had become part of a grotesque experiment, one that defied all logic and reason. The luminaries' leaves enveloped us, their scary light casting us into a surreal, nightmarish world. It was a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred, a place where the laws of nature were bent and twisted. And as the luminaries consumed us, I couldn't help but wonder if the plant had become a doorway to a world beyond our comprehension, a world of darkness and malevolence. It was a world that had claimed us, a world that we would never escape. The night shift had become a night of horror, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. Story 3. The night shift was always my least favorite part of the job. The empty hallways of St. Martin's retirement home seemed to echo with the ghostly memories of its inhabitants. The corridors played tricks on my tired eyes, and the creaks and groans of the old building were unnerving. But it was a paycheck and I had bills to pay. As the new night nurse on duty, I was responsible for the well-being of the elderly residents during the darkest hours. Most of them slept through the night, but a few would occasionally need my assistance. The isolation of the night shift only heightened my unease. It was as if the building itself was haunted by the shadows of the past. The first few weeks were relatively uneventful, except for the occasional patient needing assistance to the bathroom or a glass of water. But as the nights passed, I began to notice peculiar things. The residents, particularly the ones with dementia, would sometimes speak in hushed tones to no one in particular. They claimed to see figures standing at the foot of their beds or hear distant whispers. I tried to reassure them, chalking it up to their old age and fragile mental states. But deep down, their stories sent a cold feeling down my spine. And then there was Mrs. Henderson. Mrs. Henderson was an elderly woman who lived in room 212. She was sharp for her age, a former librarian who still possessed a wealth of knowledge. But as the weeks went by, I noticed she became increasingly agitated during my shifts. One night as I entered her room to check on her, she grabbed my arm with surprising strength. Her eyes were wide with fear as she whispered, They're watching. Don't you see them, dear? They're always there. I followed her gaze, but there was nothing to see. The room was empty, save for the soft glow of the nightlight. I tried to soothe her, telling her it was just her imagination. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was amiss. As days turned into weeks, I noticed a pattern. The residents' restlessness seemed to increase with each passing night. 
They would talk of shadowy figures, distant voices, and faces in the windows. I began to doubt my own sanity, wondering if the isolation and dark atmosphere of the retirement home were playing tricks on my mind. One night, as I made my rounds, I heard a faint sound coming from the basement. It was a soft, melodic hum that made my blood freeze. I decided to investigate, my curiosity getting the best of me. I descended the creaky stairs, and as I reached the bottom, the humming grew louder. The basement was a labyrinthine maze of storage rooms and long-forgotten furniture. The source of the humming seemed to be coming from one of the rooms at the end of the corridor. The door was slightly ajar, and a pale, eerie light seeped through the crack. As I pushed the door open, I was met with a scene that froze me in my tracks. In the center of the room, a group of elderly residents sat in a circle, their faces twisted with a strange mix of fear and ecstasy. They were chanting in a language I couldn't comprehend, their voices rising and falling in an unsettling rhythm. In the center of the circle was Mrs. Henderson. Her eyes rolled back in her head, her frail body swaying to the haunting melody. My heart raced as I watched the bizarre spectacle unfold before me. I had no idea what I was witnessing, but it felt like something out of a nightmare. I couldn't move, couldn't speak as the chanting continued. It was as if time had stopped and I was trapped in this surreal otherworldly moment. I finally mustered the courage to step back and quietly close the door, retreating to the safety of the narrow corridor. My mind raced with questions and fear. What were they doing? What was the purpose of that strange ritual? I decided to consult my supervisor in the morning, hoping for an explanation. The morning couldn't come soon enough. I rushed to my supervisor's office, my heart pounding with anxiety. I explained what I had witnessed in the basement, expecting shock and disbelief. But to my surprise, my supervisor's face remained unnervingly calm. That's nothing to worry about, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand. Sometimes they just do strange things at night. It's part of their condition. I tried to protest to convey the urgency of the situation, but he brushed it off as the ramblings of confused elderly residents. I couldn't help but feel as though there was more to the story than he was letting on. That night, I couldn't get the image of the basement ritual out of my mind. I felt a growing sense of unease, a gnawing fear that there was something sinister lurking in the shadows of St. Martin's retirement home. As I made my rounds that evening, I couldn't help but notice the tension in the air. The residents seemed more restless than ever, their eyes darting around as if they were constantly on edge. It was as if the retirement home had become a pressure cooker ready to burst at any moment. And then it happened. As I entered Mrs. Henderson's room, I found her lying in bed, her eyes wide with terror. She pointed a trembling finger towards the window, her voice barely more than a whisper. They're here, she said, her voice quivering. The watchers in the night, they're waiting for you. I turned to look out the window, half expecting to see some malevolent presence lurking in the darkness. But there was nothing, just the same empty courtyard and the distant glow of streetlights. I tried to calm Mrs. Henderson, but her fear was palpable. She clutched my arm and begged me not to leave her alone. I decided to stay with her, hoping to provide some comfort in the face of her overwhelming terror. As the night wore on, Mrs. Henderson's fear only intensified. She spoke of the watchers in the night, of the things they had seen and the terrible secrets they held. It was a chilling narrative that creeped me out. Suddenly, the lights in the room flickered and dimmed casting mysterious shadows on the walls. Mrs. Henderson's grip on my arm tightened, and she gasped in terror. I turned to look at the window, and that's when I saw them. Figures, dark and indistinct, stood outside the window. They were tall and featureless, their outlines shifting and swaying in the night breeze. Mrs. Henderson's eyes were locked onto them, her face a mask of pure horror. I tried to pull the curtains shut to block out the nightmarish figures, but they seemed to flicker in and out of existence, as if they were ethereal and insubstantial. I was overcome with a sense of dread, a feeling that we were being watched by something vicious and beyond our understanding. Mrs. Henderson's frail voice broke the silence, her words laced with terror. They're the watchers in the night. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I couldn't bear to look at those shadowy figures any longer. I grabbed Mrs. Henderson, her trembling body in my arms and rushed out of the room. As I made my way down the hallway, 
I noticed that the other residents were also in a state of fear and agitation. They spoke of the watchers in the night, of their long-awaited arrival. The retirement home had descended into chaos. Residents roamed the corridors in a daze, their voices filled with terror and confusion. It was as if a sinister force had descended upon the building, and there was no escape from its grasp. I desperately tried to call for help, but the phone lines were dead, and the lights continued to flicker, casting weird, dancing shadows on the walls. The building seemed to groan and creak, as if it were a living, breathing entity. As I led Mrs. Henderson down the stairwell, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being pursued. The air was thick with an oppressive sense of dread, and the dark figures seemed to be closing in on us. Finally, we reached the ground floor, but the entrance seemed impossibly far away. The retirement home had become a nightmarish labyrinth, and we were trapped in its web of fear and uncertainty. Just as we reached the entrance, I heard a soft, melodic hum, the same creepy tune that I had heard in the basement. I turned to look behind us, and the figures were there, their shadowy forms looming in the darkness. They were closing in, their presence suffocating and malicious. I pushed the heavy double doors open, the night air rushing in to greet us. As I stepped out into the courtyard, I felt a strange sensation, as if the ground beneath me was shifting and undulating. I turned to look back at the retirement home, and what I saw will haunt me for the rest of my days. The building seemed to contort and twist, its windows transforming into gaping, hollow eyes that stared out at me with an otherworldly malevolence. The retirement home had become a nightmarish entity, a living, breathing abomination that defied all reason and logic. Mrs. Henderson's voice broke through my shock, her trembling words a haunting lament. They've been waiting for you, waiting for your turn. I turned and fled into the night, leaving the retirement home and its horrors behind. The night air was cold and unforgiving, and the darkness seemed to stretch on into eternity. As I stumbled through the streets, I couldn't help but wonder what had become of the residents and the sinister figures that had pursued us. I was haunted by the memory of the retirement home, a place where the boundaries between reality and nightmare had blurred and twisted. The night shift had turned into a night of terror, a night that would forever haunt my dreams. The retirement home and its dark secrets were now a part of me, an unending nightmare that I could never escape. And as I walked through the cold, unforgiving darkness, I couldn't help but wonder if the retirement home was still there, waiting for its next victim, waiting for my turn to come. In the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, there existed a remote camping spot known only to a select few adventurers. It was a place of pristine beauty, where the rugged terrain and dense forests created a sanctuary for those seeking solace in nature. A group of friends, James, Emma, and Daniel, decided to embark on a camping trip to this hidden gem. They were experienced outdoors enthusiasts, and had heard tales of the untouched wilderness and pristine streams of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Appalachians was challenging, requiring them to navigate steep slopes and dense underbrush. But the promise of unspoiled wilderness and the chance to disconnect from the modern world drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled in a valley surrounded by towering peaks. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, far removed from the trappings of civilization. They pitched their tents and spent the day hiking through the rugged terrain, as night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its crackling flames providing a sense of warmth and security in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such isolated locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, waiting for something to happen. In the middle of the night, James was awoken by a sound that sent a shiver down his spine, a faint echoing voice calling out in the darkness. He woke Emma and Daniel, and together they listened for any sign of distress. The voice came again, a desperate plea for help, and it was unmistakably human. They knew they had to investigate, fearing that someone might be in danger. Armed with flashlights, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The forest was eerily silent as they ventured into its depths, the only sound the distant rush of the nearby stream. They soon came upon a small clearing, where they discovered an old tattered tent. 
Cautiously, they entered the tent, their flashlights revealing a scene of disarray. Sleeping bags were torn open, and supplies were scattered across the floor. It was as if the occupants had fled in a panic. Then they heard it again, the voice this time closer, as if it were just beyond the trees. They followed the sound, their hearts pounding with trepidation. It led them to a narrow trail that wound deeper into the forest. As they ventured further along the trail, they stumbled upon a backpack and a hiking jacket, abandoned on the ground as if their owner had hastily discarded them. It was a chilling sight, a sign that someone had been in distress. The voice came again echoing through the trees, desperate and pleading. It sent shivers down their spines and they knew they had to leave the forest immediately, fearing that they too might become victims of whatever unseen force had claimed the camper. They retreated from the wilderness of the Appalachians, their encounter with the phantom camper forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if the voice they had heard was the desperate plea of a lost soul, forever trapped in the remote wilderness, forever seeking escape from the enigmatic forces that had claimed them. Story 2 Deep in the heart of the Adirondack Mountains, there existed a remote and secluded camping spot known only to a few seasoned adventurers. It was a place untouched by modernity, a paradise for those seeking solitude and communion with nature. One crisp autumn weekend, a trio of friends, Ben, Emily, and Alex, embarked on a camping trip to this hidden gem. They were avid hikers and had heard tales of the pristine wilderness and untouched beauty of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Adirondacks was challenging, requiring them to traverse rugged terrain and ford rushing rivers. But the promise of pristine wilderness and untouched beauty drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled in a small valley surrounded by towering pine trees. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, far removed from the trappings of civilization. They pitched their tents by the edge of a crystal clear stream and spent the day hiking through the pristine forest. As night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its crackling flames providing a sense of warmth and security in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such remote locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. They couldn't quite put their finger on it. In the morning, they discovered the source of their unease. Surrounding their campsite were dozens of footprints, human footprints, leading to and from the stream. It was as if someone had been walking around their campsite while they slept. They followed the footprints, their hearts pounding with trepidation. The tracks led deeper into the forest, becoming more erratic as they went. It was as if the person had been wandering aimlessly in the dark. Suddenly, they came upon a small, dilapidated cabin hidden deep in the woods. Its windows were shattered, and its door hung off its hinges. It was a chilling sight, a place that seemed to have been abandoned for years. Cautiously, they entered the cabin, their flashlights illuminating the decaying interior. As they explored, they found old newspapers and photographs, all dating back decades. The cabin seemed to be a relic of the past, frozen in time. Then they heard a soft whispering, a voice that seemed to echo through the cabin's walls. It was a woman's voice filled with sorrow and longing. They followed the sound, which led them to a small room at the back of the cabin. Inside the room, they discovered a diary, its pages filled with the handwritten entries of a woman named Evelyn. Her words spoke of loneliness, isolation, and a deep yearning for human connection. She wrote of a tragedy that had befallen her family, leaving her alone in the wilderness. As they read on, the entries grew more chilling. Evelyn spoke of strange occurrences in the forest, of eerie figures that seemed to watch her from the shadows. She described sleepless nights haunted by whispers and footsteps outside her cabin. The final entry was dated decades ago and spoke of a decision to leave the cabin and seek help. But there was an ominous tone to the words, as if Evelyn knew that she was leaving something behind, something that would never let her go. As they exited the cabin, they noticed that the footprints had disappeared as if they had never been there. It was as if the cabin itself had drawn them in, revealing its secrets and then erasing all evidence of their presence. They left the remote wilderness of the Adirondacks, their encounter with the cabin and its enigmatic past forever etched in their memories. 
They couldn't help but wonder if Evelyn's spirit still lingered in the forest, a lost soul forever seeking connection in the wilderness. Story three. In the heart of the Smoky Mountains, there existed a hidden camping spot known only to a select few. It was a place of unparalleled beauty, where the dense forest stretched as far as the eye could see, and the stars shone with a brilliance unmatched by city lights. A group of friends, Jake, Megan, and Chris, decided to embark on a camping trip to this secluded paradise. They were avid outdoors enthusiasts and had heard stories of the pristine wilderness and abundant wildlife of the area. Their journey took them deep into the heart of the Smoky Mountains, where they pitched their tents near a pristine mountain stream. It was a place of breathtaking beauty, untouched by the trappings of modernity. As the day turned to night, they gathered around a campfire, sharing stories and laughter under the canopy of stars. The forest seemed alive with the sounds of night creatures, their calls and rustlings creating a symphony of nature. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rushing of the nearby stream. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, waiting for something to happen. In the early hours of the morning, Chris was awoken by a sound that chilled him to the bone, a distant, echoing gunshot. He shook Jake and Megan awake, and they listened in the darkness for any sign of danger. The forest was silent, as if the gunshot had never occurred. They wondered if it had been a hunter in the distance, but something about the sound had seemed off, as if it didn't belong in the tranquil wilderness. As they debated whether to investigate, they heard it again, the unmistakable sound of a gunshot, much closer this time. It echoed through the forest, sending shivers down their spines. They decided to leave their campsite immediately, fearing that they might be in the line of fire. But as they packed up their gear, they heard something that froze them in their tracks, a series of eerie, ghostly whispers seemingly carried on the wind. The whispers spoke of death and despair, of a hunter condemned to roam the forest for eternity. They spoke of a curse that had befallen him, a curse that bound him to the wilderness. Terrified but compelled to uncover the source of the haunting whispers, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The moonlight illuminated their path, casting eerie shadows on the towering trees. They soon came upon a clearing where an old, dilapidated hunting cabin stood. Its windows were shattered, and its door hung off its hinges. It was a chilling sight, a place that seemed to have been abandoned for years. Cautiously, they entered the cabin, their flashlights revealing the decaying interior. As they explored, they found old hunting gear and trophies, all covered in dust and cobwebs. It was as if the cabin had been frozen in time. In a corner of the cabin, they discovered a journal, its pages filled with the handwritten entries of a man named Samuel. His words spoke of a love for hunting and the thrill of the chase. But as they read on, the entries grew darker, revealing a descent into obsession and madness. Samuel wrote of a fateful day when he had wounded a majestic buck, but had been unable to claim his prize. He spoke of a mysterious figure that had appeared in the forest, cursing him to roam the wilderness as a phantom hunter, forever seeking the elusive buck. The final entry was dated decades ago and spoke of Samuel's decision to leave the cabin and seek help. But there was a sense of hopelessness in his words, as if he knew that he was bound to the forest, unable to escape the curse that had befallen him. As they exited the cabin, they noticed that the forest had grown silent, as if the whispers had ceased. It was as if the cabin itself had drawn them in, revealing its secrets, and then silencing its haunting past. They left the Smoky Mountains, their encounter with the cabin and its enigmatic past forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if Samuel's spirit still roamed the forest, a phantom hunter forever seeking his elusive prey. Story 4 In the remote wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, there existed a pristine camping spot known only to a handful of intrepid explorers. It was a place of rugged beauty, where towering trees reached for the sky, and the sound of rushing rivers filled the air. A group of friends, Mia, Ethan, and Lily, decided to embark on a camping trip to this hidden haven. They were outdoor enthusiasts and had heard tales of the untouched wilderness and abundant wildlife of the area. Their journey into the heart of the Pacific Northwest was challenging, requiring them to navigate dense forests and ford rushing rivers. 
but the promise of unspoiled wilderness and breathtaking vistas drove them forward. They arrived at their secluded campsite, nestled on the banks of a pristine river. It was a place of unparalleled beauty, far removed from the trappings of modernity. They pitched their tents and spent the day hiking through the lush forest. As night descended, they gathered around a campfire, its warm glow providing a sense of comfort in the remote wilderness. The stars overhead shone with a brilliance only found in such isolated locations. As they settled in for the night, they heard the distant call of an owl and the rustling of leaves in the forest. But there was something else, something unsettling about the night. It was as if the forest held its breath, as if it were waiting for something to happen. In the middle of the night, Mia was awoken by a sound that sent a chill down her spine, a distant echoing cry for help. She woke Ethan and Lily, and together they listened in the darkness for any sign of distress. The cry came again, closer this time, and it was unmistakably human. They knew they had to investigate, fearing that someone might be in danger. With flashlights in hand, they followed the sound deeper into the forest. The forest was eerily silent as they ventured into its depths, the only sound the rushing of the river in the distance. They soon came upon a small clearing where they discovered a tent pitched haphazardly. Cautiously, they entered the tent, their flashlights revealing a scene of chaos. Sleeping bags were tossed about and supplies were strewn across the floor. It was as if the occupants had fled in a hurry. Then they heard it again, the cry for help, this time coming from deeper in the forest. They followed the sound, their hearts pounding with trepidation. It led them to a narrow trail that disappeared into the trees. As they ventured further along the trail, they stumbled upon a journal, its pages filled with handwritten entries. It belonged to a woman named Sarah, and her words spoke of a solo camping trip in the wilderness. Sarah wrote of the beauty of the forest and the solitude she had found in its depths, but as they read on, the entries grew more unsettling. She described strange occurrences in the night, of eerie shadows and ghostly whispers that seemed to haunt her campsite. The final entry was dated only a few nights ago and spoke of a chilling encounter. Sarah had heard the cries for help in the darkness, and when she had ventured out of her tent to investigate, she had been met with a sense of overwhelming dread. She wrote of a presence in the forest, a malevolent force that seemed to watch her every move. She feared that she was being hunted, that something in the wilderness wanted to claim her. As they continued down the trail, they found themselves in a small clearing, where they discovered a backpack and a pair of hiking boots. It was as if Sarah had vanished without a trace, leaving behind only her belongings. The cry for help came again, this time echoing through the trees closer than ever. It sent shivers down their spines, and they knew they had to leave the forest immediately fearing that they too might become victims of whatever malevolent force had claimed Sarah. They retreated from the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest, their encounter with the mysterious disappearance forever etched in their memories. They couldn't help but wonder if Sarah's spirit still haunted the forest, a lost soul forever seeking answers to the enigmatic forces that had claimed her. Story 5. Nestled in the heart of the dense forest, Willow Lake had always been a tranquil and picturesque camping destination. Families and nature enthusiasts flocked to its shores during the summer months, seeking respite from the hustle and bustle of the city. One warm July weekend, a group of friends, Sarah, Mike, Lisa, and Tom, decided to embark on a camping trip to Willow Lake. They had heard stories of its serene beauty and the abundance of wildlife in the area. It seemed like the perfect getaway. They arrived at the campsite, pitched their tents and spent the day hiking along the trails that crisscrossed the woods. As evening descended, they gathered around a crackling campfire, roasting marshmallows and sharing ghost stories. As the night deepened, an eerie stillness settled over the forest. The usual sounds of nocturnal creatures seemed to have vanished, leaving the group in a hushed silence that was punctuated only by the crackling of the fire. Sarah, an avid photographer, decided to capture the beauty of the moonlit lake. She ventured toward the water's edge, her camera in hand. The others watched as she framed her shot, capturing the shimmering reflection of the full moon on the tranquil surface. Just as Sarah was about to take her photo, she heard a faint whisper behind her. Startled, she turned, but there was no one there. She dismissed it as a trick of the wind and snapped her photo. But as the flash illuminated the area, it revealed a chilling sight. 
Standing at the water's edge was a figure, its back to Sarah. It appeared to be a woman, her long, disheveled hair flowing down her back. Sarah called out to the figure, asking if she was lost or needed help. There was no response. The figure remained motionless, facing the lake. Sarah cautiously approached, her heart pounding in her chest. When she reached out to touch the woman's shoulder, the figure turned slowly, revealing a face etched with sadness and despair. Her eyes were vacant and her lips moved soundlessly as if trying to convey a message. Terrified, Sarah stumbled backward, her friends rushing to her side. They saw the spectral figure too, standing by the water's edge, a ghostly presence that seemed to radiate sorrow. They decided to pack up and leave the campsite immediately, their fear overpowering their curiosity. As they retreated, they glanced back one last time to see the figure disappear into the moonlit mist. The group never returned to Willow Lake, their encounter with the mysterious apparition forever etched in their memories. They would later learn that the lake had a history of tragedies, including drownings and disappearances, leaving them to wonder if the ghostly woman they had encountered was a lost soul still seeking peace. I've always been a nature enthusiast, and hiking has been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember. It was a sunny Saturday morning when I decided to embark on a solo hiking adventure in a remote and less traveled part of the Rocky Mountains. The idea was to find tranquility, to escape the bustling city life and reconnect with nature. The trail I chose led into an uncharted territory, a region that had been rarely explored by hikers. It was an area rich in dense forests, rolling hills and breathtaking vistas. The promise of solitude and a genuine wilderness experience excited me. The day began with optimism and a sense of adventure. The early morning sun cast long shadows through the trees as I hiked deeper into the woods. The trail was marked, but it became increasingly overgrown and less maintained as I progressed. It was clear that few had ventured this far, but that only added to the appeal. The songs of birds and the rustling of leaves underfoot accompanied me. As the day wore on, I paused by a tranquil creek to refill my water bottle. The sun dappled the water's surface, and I could see small fish darting in the clear stream. I was in awe of the untouched beauty of the place. My goal was to reach a high ridge from which I'd have a panoramic view of the surrounding wilderness. I knew I would need to make camp up there for the night. With each step, I felt more disconnected from the outside world and more attuned to the wilderness that enveloped me. As the sun began to set, I found the perfect spot on the ridge to set up my campsite. I pitched my tent near the edge where I'd have a clear view of the sunrise. I sat by the fire cooking a simple meal and watching the stars twinkle above. But as night fell, the forest around me came alive with strange sounds. Owls hooted in the distance and the leaves rustled in the breeze. It was the kind of experience I had yearned for, and I was fully in my element. However, it was during the night that my journey took an unsettling turn. I awoke to a cold, chilling howl that echoed through the trees. It was unlike any sound I had ever heard, a low and mournful cry that sent shivers down my spine. My heart raced as I listened to the haunting howl. It was followed by more, as if a pack of unseen creatures were communicating through the night. Fear gripped me and I realized that I was not alone in the wilderness. I had been trained to handle encounters with wildlife and knew that some animals could be territorial or curious, but this felt different. The howling continued, drawing nearer to my campsite. The sensation of being watched grew stronger and I began to question whether this was a natural occurrence or something more ominous. With a flashlight in hand, I unzipped the tent and peered into the darkness. I couldn't see anything beyond the circle of light but the howling was closer now, echoing from the surrounding trees. My instincts told me to remain in the tent, but curiosity and fear pushed me to investigate. I cautiously made my way to the edge of the ridge where the forest below was obscured by shadows. The howling grew louder, and I began to make out the silhouettes of creatures moving through the underbrush. Their eyes gleamed with an scary, phosphorescent glow in the dim light of my flashlight. It was a pack of wolves, their silvery fur illuminated by the beam of my flashlight. They moved with a fluid grace, circling my campsite, their eyes locked onto me. My heart pounded in my chest as I watched the pack. 
It was a mesmerizing and terrifying sight. I had encountered wolves before, but I had never seen them behave like this, so close to a human presence. The leader of the pack, a massive silver-coated wolf, approached the edge of the ridge and locked eyes with me. Its gaze was intense and unwavering, as if it held a deep intelligence. I knew better than to run or make any sudden movements. For what felt like an eternity, I and the wolf maintained our silent standoff, each assessing the other. The howling of the pack had ceased, and the forest was still. The moment was surreal, a connection between man and beast in the heart of the wilderness. Then, with a subtle nod of its head, the wolf turned and led the pack back into the darkness of the forest. The dark, phosphorescent glow of their eyes faded into the night, and the howling resumed, echoing through the trees as they disappeared from view. I was left with a profound sense of wonder and a touch of fear. The wilderness had a way of revealing its secrets, and I had just witnessed a spectacle that few could claim to have experienced. The following morning, I awoke to the sound of birdsong and the warmth of the rising sun. The wolves were gone, leaving only their footprints and the memory of their haunting presence. I continued my hike, my perspective on the wilderness forever changed. I marveled at the untamed beauty of the land and the mysteries that it held. It was a reminder that even in the most remote corners of the world, we are not truly alone. As the days passed, I trekked deeper into the uncharted woods, exploring landscapes that few had laid eyes on. The trail had become less defined and the forest more untamed, but I continued on, driven by a sense of adventure and the allure of the unknown. The solitude of the wilderness surrounded me, and I embraced it as a kind of sanctuary. I couldn't help but feel that the forest had revealed a side of itself to me, a realm that few would ever have the privilege to witness. But as time passed, I began to realize that I was venturing deeper into uncharted territory, away from the well-trodden paths of civilization. The forest had a way of distorting time and space, and the sense of isolation grew stronger with each passing day. I continued my journey searching for the next breathtaking vista, the next uncharted wonder. My supplies were dwindling and my encounters with wildlife became more frequent. In the end, I couldn't help but wonder if the uncharted woods held a truth that was beyond my comprehension a realm of solitude and fascination that would forever remain a mystery. My journey had been a descent into the unknown, a venture into a realm of fear and wonder, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time in the uncharted woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the uncertainty that exist in the natural world. Story 2 I've always had a deep love for the outdoors, so it wasn't unusual for me to spend weekends exploring new hiking trails in the wilderness of upstate New York. This particular weekend, I decided to venture into the vast Catskill Mountains, an area renowned for its beauty and serenity. The crisp morning air greeted me as I embarked on my hike, following a well-marked trail into the dense forest. The path was clear and the sun filtered through the leaves, casting a dappled light on the forest floor. The sounds of nature surrounded me, from the chirping of birds to the gentle rustling of leaves in the breeze. As I hiked deeper into the woods, I became increasingly aware of the sheer solitude that enveloped me. There was a tranquil and a dead silence that settled over the forest. Although I was alone, I couldn't help but feel as if unseen eyes were watching my every step. The feeling was unnerving, but I shrugged it off as a product of the profound quiet. Hours passed as I ventured further into the forest. The trail had become narrower and the dense underbrush encroached on both sides. I felt a sense of vulnerability, a realization that I was in a remote area where help was far from reach. My goal for the day had been to reach a pristine mountain lake I had read about, nestled deep within the Catskills. It was rumored to be a hidden gem, a place of breathtaking beauty. But as the day wore on, I began to worry that I had veered off the path. I took out my map and compass to assess my location, but to my shock, I couldn't find them. Panic surged through me as I realized that I must have left them behind at my last rest stop. I cursed my carelessness, but told myself that I could rely on my intuition and make my way back. I turned to retrace my steps, but to my surprise, the trail I had been following seemed to have disappeared. The once clear path had become an overgrown tangle of branches and underbrush. I fought back the rising fear and decided to push forward. 
confident that I could eventually find my way back to the main trail. The hours passed and my sense of unease deepened as I continued to walk deeper into the woods. The forest around me had grown unfamiliar, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was lost. The towering trees seemed to loom over me, their branches blocking out the sunlight. The stillness of the woods was broken only by the occasional call of a distant bird. As the day turned into evening, I made the difficult decision to set up camp. I gathered wood for a fire and constructed a makeshift shelter using branches and leaves. The night was quiet and dark, save for the soft rustling of leaves in the wind. The following morning I was determined to find my way back to civilization. I scoured the area for any signs of the trail, but it was as if the path had vanished entirely. I couldn't understand how I had managed to get so disoriented in what should have been a straightforward hike. I continued to walk, driven by a growing sense of desperation. The forest felt like a labyrinth, with no clear direction or landmarks to guide me. The solitude of the wilderness, which had once been so serene, now felt oppressive and isolating. Each step I took seemed to lead me further into the depths of the forest, away from the familiar world I had known. The shadows of the trees cast long shapes on the ground, and the silence was punctuated only by the sounds of my own footsteps. I searched for any signs of human activity, a path, or a clearing that might lead me to safety, but the forest held no answers. I couldn't help but feel as if I had stepped into a different world, a place where the rules of reality no longer applied, desperate to find my way back. My supplies were running low and I had no means of communication with the outside world. I was well and truly alone, a lost soul in the heart of the Catskills. The forest offered no relief from the oppressive silence, and the solitude weighed heavily on my shoulders. The feeling of being watched never left me, and I couldn't escape the sensation that I was not alone. In my desperate search for a way out, I stumbled upon a small, decrepit cabin deep in the woods, it was an unexpected discovery, a structure that seemed out of place in the heart of the wilderness. I approached cautiously, the cabin's weathered walls casting long, creepy shadows in the fading light. Inside I found the remnants of a life long gone. Old furniture, rusted cookware, and faded photographs covered the cabin's interior. It was as if time had stood still, frozen in a moment from the past. I couldn't help but wonder who had lived in the cabin and what had become of them. The place seemed abandoned, but there was an unsettling feeling of being watched, as if the walls themselves held secrets. I spent the night in the cabin, sheltered from the elements. The hours passed slowly, the darkness outside growing more oppressive. I couldn't escape the feeling that the forest was closing in around me, that I was a mere intruder in a place that did not belong to me. The following morning I continued my journey through the woods, determined to find a way out. But the forest seemed intent on keeping its secrets. I came across strange symbols carved into the trees, intricate patterns that seemed to form a trail of their own. I followed them, hoping they would lead me to safety, but they only seemed to take me deeper into the wilderness. The sense of isolation and despair deepened with each passing day. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn deeper into the heart of the forest, as if it had a scary will of its own. I fought to keep my hope alive, clinging to the belief that I would one day find my way back to civilization. The forest had become my prison, a place of fear and uncertainty, and I was a lost soul in a realm of shadows and enigma. In the end, I couldn't escape the feeling that I had ventured into a world where time had no meaning, a place where the boundaries between the known and the unknown had blurred and merged. The forest had become a place of isolation and fear, and I was forever lost in its depths. My ordeal in the wilderness had been a descent into the unknown, a journey into a realm of solitude and desperation. The forest had revealed its enigmatic and unforgiving nature, and I had emerged from the experience forever changed. I had returned from the depths of the wilderness, but the memories of my time lost in the woods would continue to haunt me, a reminder of the beauty and the dangers that exist in the natural world. Story 3 I had always been an adventurous soul. The thrill of the unknown and the call of the wild had guided me through countless trails and uncharted paths. But nothing could have prepared me for that one fateful journey into the dense, foreboding woods. It was a crisp autumn morning when I set out, the leaves beneath my boots crunching like brittle bones, 
A cold wind rustled the trees and I shivered, though I couldn't tell if it was from excitement or the chilling breeze. The forest loomed before me, a sea of trees that seemed to stretch endlessly. I had heard tales of its vastness, but my youthful arrogance led me to believe I could conquer it. As I ventured deeper, the trees closed in around me, casting long, sinister shadows. The sunlight filtered through the leaves in sporadic beams, creating a scary patchwork of light and dark. With each step, my sense of direction began to blur. The trail I'd followed was gradually erased by the relentless march of the undergrowth. Panic clawed at the edges of my mind, but I pushed it away, convincing myself that I could backtrack. Hours passed, and my futile attempts to retrace my steps only left me more disoriented. The forest was a labyrinth, a place where time and space seemed to warp and twist, playing tricks on my senses. The more I struggled to find my way, the further I sank into the heart of the wilderness. My hunger gnawed at my insides, and the water in my canteen was running dangerously low. Panic had now fully engulfed me. The forest felt sentient, as though it were mocking my feeble attempts to escape. The distant calls of wildlife became whispers, and the rustling leaves carried unsettling secrets. I felt as if I was being watched, stalked by something unseen. Night fell like a shroud and I huddled under a makeshift shelter of leaves and branches, feeling utterly exposed. The chilling symphony of the forest at night enveloped me, the howls of distant animals and the rustling of unseen creatures. Sleep was elusive as every rustle or distant sound sent me into a state of high alert. Morning brought no solace. The woods seemed to have transformed overnight, the once familiar path now a maze of confusion. I decided to walk in a straight line, desperate to escape this haunting place. But the forest had other plans. It led me in circles and my strength waned with each step. I was hungry, tired, and on the brink of despair. It was then that I saw him, or at least I thought I did. A shadowy figure darted between the trees just at the edge of my vision. My heart raced and I chased after it, convinced it was my way out. But the figure remained elusive, a phantom in the woods. Days turned into weeks and my desperation grew. I survived on a diet of berries and rainwater, but it was far from enough. My once taut frame had become emaciated and my clothes clung to my shrunken body. The lines between reality and delusion blurred and I often heard voices calling my name from the darkness, though no one was there. One night, as I lay beneath a twisted oak tree, the forest revealed its true nature. I was jolted awake by the sensation of something warm and wet on my hand. In the pale moonlight, I saw it, an animal carcass torn and eviscerated, its entrails spread around my shelter like a gruesome offering. Fear clenched my heart as I realized the cruel message that the forest had sent. It was as if the wilderness had become a sentient, sinister entity, toying with me, luring me deeper into its clutches. I knew then that I was no longer alone in these woods, but I could never be sure who or what was watching me. The forest held secrets darker than the night, and I had become ensnared in its web of terror. Hunger and fear drove me to the brink of madness, and I began to question my own sanity. And then, one fateful day, I saw him again. The shadowy figure, this time closer, more distinct. It was a man, disheveled and wild, with eyes that held a hint of madness. He beckoned to me, his voice a mere whisper on the wind. In my fragile state, I followed him without question, convinced that he was my salvation. He led me to a small clearing in the heart of the forest, where a ramshackle cabin stood. It was a crude structure, cobbled together from rotting wood and tattered cloth. Inside, a fire crackled in a makeshift hearth casting mystic shadows on the walls. The man, whose name was Elijah, explained that he had been lost in the woods for years, just like me. He had learned to survive in this unforgiving wilderness, and he offered me food and shelter. Desperation clouded my judgment, and I accepted his hospitality, though a nagging voice in my mind warned me that there was something deeply unsettling about him. Days turned into weeks as I lived in the cabin with Elijah, my only companion in this forsaken place. He spoke of the forest as if it were a living, breathing entity, a dark force that demanded sacrifices. He claimed that he had made a pact with the forest, offering it sustenance in return for his own survival. As the weeks passed, I began to notice the gruesome trophies that adorned the cabin's walls, skulls of animals and even a few human bones. It was then that the horrifying truth began to dawn on me. 
Elijah was not merely a survivor, he was a part of the very darkness that had consumed the forest. He was a cannibal. The realization struck me like a lightning bolt and I knew I had to escape. But the forest, now even more sinister, seemed to tighten its grip on me. Every attempt to leave was thwarted, as if the trees themselves conspired to keep me there. Elijah's sanity unraveled further, and he spoke of the forest's insatiable hunger, of the countless lost souls who had met their end within its depths. I knew that my only chance lay in outwitting Elijah, and so I bided my time, pretending to embrace his twisted worldview. I learned his routines and waited for the right moment. One fateful night, as he lay in a feverish sleep, I made my move. The forest, it seemed, had grown tired of its plaything. I crept out of the cabin, my heart pounding like a drum, and plunged deeper into the woods, my every step a prayer to the forces of nature for salvation. The forest seemed to part before me, as if it had grown weary of the game and I stumbled upon a trail. With a newfound burst of energy, I followed it, guided by the distant glow of moonlight. But I was free, and I would never forget the horrors I had witnessed within the heart of the unforgiving forest. The tale of my ordeal became a cautionary legend among those who dared to enter the woods, a reminder of the darkness that could consume even the most adventurous souls. As I sit here alone in this forgotten room, the memories of that fateful summer flood back, like a relentless tide of darkness. I never thought I'd be entangled in something so sinister, so surreal. But here I am, recounting my story, hoping that it serves as a cautionary tale. It all began innocently enough. I had recently graduated from college, eager to embark on the adventure of adult life. The world stretched out before me, full of possibilities. I had moved to a new city and was slowly settling into my job. But something was missing. A sense of belonging, a community. Little did I know that longing would lead me down a path I could never have imagined. One sunny afternoon, while sipping coffee at a local cafe, I noticed a flyer on the community board. It was an invitation to a gathering promising enlightenment and inner peace. The group called themselves the Cult of the Silent Shadows. The flyer showed a serene, masked figure bathed in moonlight, holding a candle. It piqued my curiosity, and with nothing to lose, I decided to attend their meeting. The address led me to an unassuming building on the outskirts of town. I entered a room filled with people of all ages, races, and backgrounds. The atmosphere was warm and inviting, and I felt an immediate sense of camaraderie. It seemed like the community I had been searching for. Their leader, a charismatic man named Gabriel, took the stage. He was a tall figure with piercing blue eyes and an air of magnetism that was impossible to ignore. He spoke eloquently about the struggles of modern life, the chaos of the world, and the need for inner tranquility. We are the silent shadows, he proclaimed, and we offer you a path to serenity, away from the noise and distractions of the outside world. His words resonated with me as they did with everyone else in the room. Gabriel spoke of meditation, mindfulness, and the power of silence in a world filled with constant chatter. It all sounded so appealing, so simple. Over the next few weeks, I attended the Silent Shadows gatherings regularly. The teachings became the anchor of my life. Gabriel's charisma and the sense of belonging I found within the group were addictive. I was not alone in my devotion, many others were equally captivated. As the days turned into months, the group's activities grew more intense. We were encouraged to immerse ourselves fully in their teachings. I began spending more time with my fellow members, often at the cult's secluded retreat deep in the woods. It was during one of these retreats that I began to notice something strange. The teachings, once focused on meditation and mindfulness, had taken a darker turn. Gabriel spoke of the need to shed our former selves, to become shadows of our former lives. He preached the power of silence, not just as a form of meditation, but as a way of life. The group started practicing silence for days at a time, communicating only through gestures and writing. We were discouraged from contacting our families and friends outside the cult, as they were seen as distractions from our true purpose. I began to feel a growing unease, but my attachment to Gabriel and the community kept me from questioning too deeply. I was not alone in my hesitation, but no one dared to speak out against the charismatic leader. One evening, as the sun set behind the trees, Gabriel gathered us around a roaring bonfire, 
the atmosphere was charged with anticipation. Gabriel announced that to become true Silent Shadows, we must undergo a ritual of purification. The ritual involved fasting for three days, spending all our waking hours in complete silence and meditating by the fire. It was meant to cleanse our minds and souls, to make us more receptive to the cult's teachings. I felt a knot of dread in my stomach but couldn't bring myself to refuse. As the days of fasting passed, I became increasingly weak. My body ached, and my mind felt like a stormy sea. The silence, once soothing, now pressed down on me like a heavy weight. It was as if we were all sinking into a darkness, a collective silence that threatened to swallow us whole. On the third night of the ritual, something changed. As we meditated around the fire, the flames seemed to dance with an eerie, unnatural intensity. Gabriel stood at the center, his eyes closed in deep concentration. Then, with a sudden and unsettling calmness, he began to chant in a language I didn't recognize. The chant grew louder and more fervent, and the flames leaped higher, casting bizarre flickering shadows on the faces of the cult members. I watched in growing horror as the atmosphere shifted from one of serenity to something altogether different. It was at that moment that I realized the true nature of the silent shadows. We were not a community seeking enlightenment and inner peace. We were pawns in Gabriel's grand delusion. He had manipulated us into a cult of silence, using our vulnerability and desire for belonging against us. I knew I had to escape. With trembling hands, I rose from my meditation spot and slowly backed away from the fire. The cult members were so engrossed in the ritual that they didn't notice my departure. I slipped into the darkness of the woods, my heart pounding like a drum. As I made my way back to civilization, I couldn't help but wonder about the fate of my fellow cult members. Had they truly become the silent shadows Gabriel had envisioned? Or had they fallen victim to a madness born of silence and isolation? I reported the cult to the authorities, but by the time they arrived at the retreat, it was empty. Gabriel and his followers had vanished, leaving behind only the lingering echoes of their chilling silence. In the years that followed, I rebuilt my life, forever haunted by the memory of the silent shadows. I learned the hard way that the quest for belonging and purpose can sometimes lead us down the darkest of paths, and I vowed to never let the shadows of silence consume me again. But even now, as I sit here alone, I can't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his cult are still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for their next unsuspecting victim. The darkness of that summer still clings to me, a constant reminder of the horrors that can hide behind a mask of serenity. Months had passed since my escape from the Cult of the Silent Shadows. I had rebuilt my life, but the memories of that nightmarish experience continued to haunt my every waking moment. I couldn't help but wonder what had become of my fellow cult members, and whether Gabriel and his twisted teachings still held them in their grip. I kept a low profile, fearing that the cult might somehow track me down. My days were spent in constant vigilance, always watching my back, always on edge. But I couldn't shake the feeling that Gabriel and his followers were out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike. One day, as I was going through my mail, I came across a letter. It was an anonymous message, a simple piece of paper with a single word written in bold letters. Silence. My heart raced as I realized that the cult had found me, or at least someone who knew about my past involvement with them. I had to find out who sent the letter, and more importantly, whether the cult was still active. I began to dig deeper, retracing my steps and reaching out to former cult members who had managed to break free like me. It wasn't easy. Many were still too frightened to talk, but gradually I pieced together a picture of what had transpired after my escape. It seemed that in the wake of my departure, the cult had become even more secretive and reclusive. They had changed their meeting locations frequently, always staying one step ahead of anyone who might be looking for them. Gabriel's hold on his followers had grown stronger, and his teachings had taken a more extreme turn. Rumors circulated that the cult had become involved in criminal activities, using their collective silence as a cover for illegal operations. But these were only whispers, and concrete information was hard to come by. Determined to expose the cult and bring an end to their reign of silence, I reached out to a journalist friend who had a reputation for investigating secretive organizations. With the evidence I had gathered, we began to dig deeper into the activities of the Cult of the Silent Shadows. 
Our investigation led us down a twisted and treacherous path. We followed leads, interviewed former cult members, and even managed to infiltrate some of their gatherings undercover. What we discovered was chilling. The cult had evolved into a tightly knit secretive society with Gabriel as its unquestioned leader. His charisma and manipulative tactics had only grown more potent over time. The members had become fanatical in their devotion, believing that silence was the key to ultimate enlightenment. But behind the facade of serenity and inner peace lay a darker truth. The cult had indeed become involved in criminal activities, ranging from money laundering to extortion. Their network stretched far and wide, with members in positions of power and influence across various industries. As we delved deeper into our investigation, we realized that exposing the cult would not be easy. They had eyes and ears everywhere, and anyone who tried to speak out against them faced threats, intimidation, and even violence. But we were determined to unmask the shadows and bring an end to their reign of terror. We compiled our findings, collected evidence, and prepared to blow the lid off the cult of the Silent Shadows. Our investigative report was set to be published in a major newspaper, promising to expose the cult's criminal activities and the dangers they pose to society. But as the publication date drew nearer, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into a trap. My fears were realized on the night before the report was scheduled to be released. I received another anonymous message, this time more ominous than the first. It was a simple warning. Silence is golden. I immediately contacted my journalist friend and we decided to go public with the threats we had received. We believed that the cult would think twice about taking any drastic action if their actions were brought to light. The next day, as the report hit the headlines, the cult's reaction was swift and brutal. They released a statement denying all allegations and accusing us of spreading lies and slander. Gabriel, in a chilling video message, warned that those who sought to expose the cult's secrets would face dire consequences. Despite our fears, we pressed on, believing that the power of truth and justice would prevail. But the cult was not to be underestimated. They launched a campaign of harassment and intimidation against us, trying to discredit our investigation and silence us through any means necessary. As the pressure mounted, my journalist friend and I received a tip that Gabriel and his inner circle would be holding a secret gathering in an isolated location. It was an opportunity we couldn't pass up. We contacted law enforcement and provided them with the information we had gathered. On the night of the raid, we accompanied the police to the remote location where the cult's gathering was taking place. The tension was palpable as we approached the compound. We knew that this would be the moment of reckoning, the final showdown with the cult of the Silent Shadows. As we stormed the compound, a fierce battle ensued. Gabriel and his followers, armed with unwavering devotion and a willingness to protect their secrets at all costs, put up a formidable resistance. But the combined efforts of law enforcement and the evidence we had gathered proved to be their undoing. Gabriel was arrested, and his mask of charisma finally shattered. The cult members were taken into custody, their reign of silence broken. The truth about their criminal activities was exposed for the world to see. In the aftermath of the raid, I couldn't help but reflect on the journey that had led me from a naive seeker of belonging to an unwitting victim of a dangerous cult, and finally to a crusader for justice. The cult of the Silent Shadows had been dismantled, its darkness brought into the light. But the scars it had left on my psyche and the lives of its former members would never fully heal. I had learned the hard way that the search for meaning and community could sometimes lead to places of unimaginable darkness. The experience left me with a profound sense of caution and a determination to be vigilant against the allure of charismatic leaders and their promises of enlightenment. Story 2 My name is Sarah and I grew up in a quiet suburban neighborhood with my loving parents David and Linda and my younger brother Michael. We were an ordinary family leading an ordinary life. Our days were filled with school, work, and the occasional family outing. But that all changed one fateful day. It was a crisp autumn afternoon when we first encountered the cult. David had taken us to the local farmer's market, a place we often visited on weekends. As we strolled among the stalls, sampling fresh produce and enjoying the vibrant atmosphere, a woman approached us. She was dressed in simple robes, her demeanor calm and serene. Hello. She said with a warm smile. I couldn't help but notice your family. You seem like kindred spirits. 
We exchanged pleasantries and the woman introduced herself as Emily. She spoke of a community called the Tranquil Souls, a group of like-minded individuals seeking inner peace and enlightenment. Emily's words were captivating and we found ourselves drawn to her presence. Over the following weeks, Emily became a frequent visitor to our home. She brought with her the teachings of the Tranquil Souls, a philosophy centered around mindfulness, meditation, and a simpler way of life. She spoke of finding tranquility in a chaotic world, and her words resonated deeply with my family. One evening, as we sat around the dinner table, Emily proposed that we attend one of the Tranquil Souls gatherings. It's an opportunity to experience our community firsthand, she said, to see if it aligns with your desires for inner peace. We were hesitant at first, but the allure of tranquility and the sense of belonging that Emily offered were too enticing to resist. With her guidance, we made the decision to visit the Tranquil Souls. Our first gathering with the Tranquil Souls was held in an idyllic rural setting. A small group of people dressed in robes similar to Emily's welcomed us with open arms. They exuded an air of serenity that was both captivating and unnerving. The teachings of the Tranquil Souls revolved around meditation, minimalism, and the renunciation of worldly possessions. At first, it seemed like a path to inner peace, a way to simplify our lives and find a sense of purpose. But as time went on, the teachings became increasingly extreme. We were encouraged to sever ties with our old lives, to let go of our possessions, and to embrace a life of austerity. The cult members spoke in hushed tones about the need to transcend the material world and reach a higher state of consciousness. My family and I became increasingly isolated from our friends and extended family as the tranquil souls became the center of our lives. Emily, once a mere acquaintance, had become our de facto leader. Her charisma and unwavering devotion to the cult were impossible to resist. As the cult's grip on our family tightened, I began to notice disturbing changes in my parents and brother. They had become increasingly distant, their eyes vacant and hollow. The cult's teachings had taken a darker turn, emphasizing the need for complete submission and the rejection of individuality. I tried to reason with my family, to convince them that we were headed down a dangerous path, but my words fell on deaf ears. They saw me as an outsider, a threat to their newfound sense of purpose. One evening I overheard a chilling conversation between my parents and Emily. They spoke of a final ceremony that would allow them to transcend the material world and achieve true enlightenment. The details were shrouded in secrecy, but the sense of foreboding in the air was palpable. Terrified for my family's safety, I reached out to a childhood friend, Rebecca, who had been concerned about our sudden withdrawal from society. I confided in her about the tranquil souls and their increasingly sinister teachings. Rebecca, now a journalist, took it upon herself to investigate the cult. She uncovered a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of mind control associated with the tranquil souls. It became clear that the cult was not what it appeared to be. Together, we devised a plan to rescue my family from the clutches of the tranquil souls. We contacted law enforcement providing them with the evidence Rebecca had gathered. It was a race against time to stop the impending final ceremony. As the authorities prepared to raid the cult's compound, Rebecca and I infiltrated the tranquil souls in disguise. We attended one of their gatherings, where the atmosphere was tense with anticipation. The cult members dressed in their robes gathered around a massive bonfire. Emily stood at the center, her eyes closed in deep concentration. The cult's teachings had culminated in this moment and I feared what would happen next. As the authorities closed in on the compound, Rebecca and I sprang into action. We distracted the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices, while law enforcement moved in to apprehend Emily and the cult leaders. A tense standoff ensued, but ultimately the cult members, my family included, were freed from the clutches of the tranquil souls. Emily and the cult leaders were arrested, their twisted beliefs exposed for all to see. In the aftermath of the rescue operation, my family and I faced a long and difficult journey of recovery. The hold of the tranquil souls had left deep scars, both physical and psychological. But with the support of therapy and the love of our extended family and friends, we began the process of healing. Rebecca's investigative reporting on the cult led to a nationwide expose, 
shedding light on the dangers of cults and the tactics they used to manipulate and control their members. The tranquil souls were disbanded and their leaders faced justice for their crimes. As I look back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the thin line between seeking inner peace and falling prey to the allure of a charismatic leader and a dangerous ideology. My family and I emerged from the darkness stronger and wiser, with a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that hold a family together. The tranquil souls may have left their mark on us, but we refuse to let their darkness define us. We were survivors, and we were determined to live our lives with newfound strength, resilience, and a commitment to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. Story 3 My name is Mark, and I've always considered myself a rational and level-headed individual. I was in a loving relationship with my girlfriend, Emily, who shared my passion for adventure and self-improvement. We enjoyed exploring new places, seeking out unique experiences and pushing the boundaries of our comfort zones. Life was a grand adventure with Emily by my side. One sunny afternoon, as Emily and I were sipping coffee at our favorite local cafe, she excitedly showed me a beautifully designed invitation. It was embossed with intricate symbols and read, The Benevolent Cult of the Hidden Truth. Emily explained that she had stumbled upon this group online and had been following their teachings for a while. She believed that they held the key to enlightenment and personal growth. The idea of joining a group called a cult made me uneasy, but Emily insisted that it was different. She claimed that they were focused on self-improvement, kindness, and uncovering hidden truths about oneself and the world. With her enthusiasm and persuasive arguments, I reluctantly agreed to attend their introductory meeting. The introductory meeting took place in a cozy yet elegant room in an inconspicuous building. We were greeted by friendly and seemingly ordinary individuals who welcomed us warmly. Emily introduced me to the group's leader, a charismatic woman named Sophia, who exuded an air of calm and wisdom. Sophia began by explaining the group's philosophy centered around kindness, self-discovery, and the pursuit of hidden truths. She emphasized that they were not a typical cult but rather a community of like-minded individuals seeking to improve themselves and make the world a better place. Emily and I attended several more meetings, each one focusing on personal development, mindfulness, and the cultivation of empathy. The group's teachings were captivating, and I started to believe that perhaps I had misunderstood the word cult. As the months went by, Emily became increasingly involved in the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. She attended their gatherings more frequently, sometimes staying overnight at their retreats. She spoke passionately about the positive changes she was experiencing and urged me to become more involved. But something didn't sit right with me. I noticed that Emily was becoming more distant from our friends and family, and her devotion to the group was bordering on obsession. She began to spend less time with me and I couldn't help but feel like I was losing her to the cult. One evening I decided to investigate the group further. I attended one of their gatherings without Emily's knowledge, hoping to uncover the truth behind their seemingly benevolent facade. As I arrived at the retreat, I noticed a serene atmosphere, with participants engaged in meditation and deep philosophical discussions. Sophia, the charismatic leader, led a session focused on the concept of inner purity and the need to shed one's past to embrace a brighter future. But then as the night wore on, I witnessed something terrifying. The group's teachings took a darker turn. Sophia began speaking about the ultimate truth that could only be achieved through sacrifice. She spoke of letting go of one's attachments, even to loved ones, to attain a higher state of consciousness. I knew I had to act quickly. The group's teachings had taken a disturbing turn, and I feared for Emily's safety. I reached out to a friend, Alex, who had experience in investigating cults and the tactics they used to manipulate their members. Together, we delved deeper into the benevolent cult of the hidden truth, uncovering a trail of disappearances, financial irregularities, and allegations of psychological manipulation. It became clear that this cult was far more sinister than it appeared. We also discovered that Sophia, the cult's leader, had a history of leading similar groups that had all ended in tragedy. She had a talent for drawing in vulnerable individuals and using her charisma to exploit them. With the evidence we had gathered, Alex and I contacted law enforcement and shared our findings. It was clear that Emily was in grave danger, 
along with the other members of the cult. We knew that we had to act swiftly to rescue them from Sophia's grip. We devised a plan to infiltrate the cult's compound during one of their retreats. With the help of law enforcement, we would apprehend Sophia and her followers and put an end to their reign of darkness. The night of the rescue mission was tense with anticipation. Alex and I disguised ourselves as cult members, armed with the evidence we had collected, and a determination to free Emily and the others from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the Hidden Truth. As we infiltrated the cult's compound, we witnessed Emily and the other members gathered around a massive bonfire. Sophia, in her charismatic and persuasive manner, was preparing them for the ultimate truth, which involved a ritualistic act of sacrifice. With law enforcement at the ready, we began to confront the cult members, urging them to reconsider their choices and the darkness that had enveloped their lives. Sophia, however, was not easily swayed. A tense standoff ensued with cult members torn between their loyalty to Sophia and the evidence of her dark intentions. As the authorities closed in, Sophia's grip began to weaken and some members started to question their devotion. In the end, Emily and the other cult members were freed from the clutches of the benevolent cult of the hidden truth. Sophia was arrested, her charismatic facade shattered. The truth about the cult's sinister activities was exposed for the world to see. As Emily and I emerged from the darkness of the cult's influence, we faced a long and challenging road to recovery. The scars ran deep, both physically and emotionally. But with the support of therapy and the love of our friends and family, we began the process of healing. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have left its mark on us, but we were determined to emerge stronger and wiser, with a newfound appreciation for the importance of critical thinking and the bonds of love that held us together. Looking back on that harrowing chapter of our lives, I can't help but reflect on the fine line between seeking personal growth and falling prey to the manipulative tactics of a charismatic leader. Emily and I emerged from the darkness stronger and more resilient, committed to living our lives with newfound wisdom and a determination to never let the shadows of a cult engulf us again. The benevolent cult of the hidden truth may have temporarily ensnared our lives, but it ultimately failed to extinguish the light of reason and love that guided us back to the truth. As I watched my family's car disappear into the distance, I couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. My parents were heading out of town for the weekend, leaving me alone in our old creaky house. I was no stranger to solitude, but this time felt different. A heavy feeling settled in my chest, and an unshakable feeling of dread began to creep into my thoughts. The house itself was a relic of the past, a grand structure with imposing pillars and a sprawling, overgrown garden. It was beautiful in its own way, but as the sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across the property, it transformed into something foreboding. I reluctantly closed the front door and locked it, the click echoing through the empty hallway. The house felt too big, too silent, and suddenly, I felt too small. The first night alone in a house could be daunting, but as time wore on I had imagined myself growing into the role. I could make my own meals, watch my favorite movies, and revel in the freedom of being the master of my own domain. Yet as I moved from room to room, something about the darkness outside felt oppressive, as if it were closing in on me. I made my way to the kitchen, trying to shake off the feeling of unease. The familiar space with its warm wooden cabinets and cozy ambience was meant to be comforting. However, the faintest hint of a draft seemed to whisper through the room. I tightened the shawl around my shoulders and decided to prepare a simple meal to distract myself. As I stood at the stove, the low hum of the refrigerator and the ticking of the kitchen clock were the only sounds that reached my ears. The house was eerily silent, and with each creak and groan, I couldn't help but feel as though it had a life of its own. I had always known it was old, but that night, it felt ancient, bearing secrets from generations long past. I finished my meal and tried to find solace in the glow of the television. I put on a comedy, but even the laugh track couldn't drown out the unsettling sense of isolation. The show's canned laughter sounded more like mocking than mirth, and I switched it off, casting the room into silence once more. Reluctantly, I made my way upstairs to my bedroom. The old wooden steps creaked beneath my weight, creating a symphony of unsettling sounds. I couldn't help but look over my shoulder, 
half expecting to see something lurking in the shadows behind me. Of course, there was nothing there, but that didn't stop the creeping feeling that I was not alone. My bedroom, with its soft muted colors and familiar scent, should have been a sanctuary, but that night, it was just another chamber in the house of unease. The window offered a view of the moonlit garden, its unkempt hedges and statues shrouded in a cold glow. I closed the curtains and turned off the lights, plunging the room into darkness. Lying in bed, I couldn't help but listen to the strange sounds of the old house. It was as if it were alive, breathing in the night, exhaling soft sighs and whispers. I closed my eyes and tried to remind myself that it was just an old house, that my unease was nothing more than my imagination running wild. Yet despite my rationalizations, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Hours passed and the darkness seemed to press down on me, heavy and suffocating. I tossed and turned in bed, unable to find comfort. The gentle, rhythmic ticking of the clock in the hallway only served to remind me of the relentless passage of time. Just as I felt myself drifting into sleep, a noise from downstairs jolted me awake. It was a soft but distinct thud, followed by the sound of something scraping against the floor. My heart began to race and I strained to listen. Silence settled in the room once more. I debated whether to investigate the source of the noise, but fear kept me frozen in place. The darkness outside my window seemed impenetrable, and the shadows in the room appeared to twist and contort. My imagination was running wild, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister lurked in the house. Another noise, this one louder and more distinct, broke the silence. It was the unmistakable sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, coming up the stairs. My heart pounded in my chest as the footsteps drew nearer, the creaking of the old wooden steps growing louder. I clutched the blanket tightly, unsure of what to do. My first instinct was to call the police, but the feeling of vulnerability kept me rooted in place. The footsteps reached the top of the staircase and drew closer to my bedroom. Panic surged through me, and I scrambled out of bed, searching for a place to hide. The closet seemed like the safest option, and I squeezed into it pulling the door closed as quietly as I could. I left a slight crack to peer through, my eyes fixed on the dimly lit room beyond. The footsteps grew louder and the door to my bedroom slowly creaked open. A figure emerged from the darkness, barely visible in the moonlight. It was a man, tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. His face was obscured, hidden by the shadows. He moved with a deliberate, almost predatory grace, as if he knew the house intimately. The intruder's presence sent a cold feeling down my spine. He moved through the room, his eyes scanning every corner. The moonlight revealed a gaunt face with hollow cheeks and a scruffy beard. In his hand, he held a knife, its blade gleaming in the dim light. I held my breath as the intruder approached the closet. His steps were slow and deliberate, and I prayed that he wouldn't discover me. The closet door seemed like paper, too flimsy to protect me from the danger lurking just outside. My heart pounded in my chest, drowning out all other sounds. The man's hand reached for the closet door, and I braced myself for the inevitable. But then, just as his fingers brushed the wood, he hesitated. A low growl echoed through the room, causing the intruder to freeze. The sound was not human. It was primal and filled with menace. I strained to see what had caused it and my eyes widened in terror. From the darkness of the room, a pair of glowing eyes emerged. They were feral, belonging to a creature that shouldn't exist within the confines of the house. The growl grew louder, more menacing, and the intruder backed away from the closet. In that moment, fear gave way to curiosity. I couldn't see the creature clearly, but I had the distinct feeling that it was not a typical household pet. It was something wild and untamed, a guardian of the darkness. The intruder, sensing that he was outmatched, fled from the room, leaving the closet door ajar. I waited, my heart still racing as the growling receded into the distance. I had narrowly escaped a terrifying encounter and the feeling of dread had shifted to one of profound gratitude. Hours passed and the first light of dawn began to filter through the curtains. With trembling hands, I emerged from the closet, still cautious and unsure of what I might find. The house was silent once more and the intruder was gone, but the encounter had left an indelible mark on me. As I watched the sunrise, I couldn't help but feel a sense of awe for the mysterious guardian that had protected me. 
The old house had revealed a hidden secret, a protector of the night that had stood between me and danger. The rest of the weekend passed without incident, and when my parents returned, I shared my harrowing experience with them. They were understandably shocked and concerned, but we found no sign of the intruder, and the police were unable to determine his identity. In the following weeks, I began to research the history of the house, hoping to uncover the origins of the guardian that had saved me. It was then that I stumbled upon an old, faded photograph, hidden in a dusty corner of the attic. The photograph depicted a man tall and slender, dressed in tattered clothing. His face was obscured, but I recognized the scruffy beard and gaunt features. He was standing in the overgrown garden, his gaze fixed on something beyond the frame. The photograph was dated more than a century ago. I couldn't explain the connection between the intruder and the man in the photograph, but it was clear that the old house held secrets that spanned generations. The guardian that had protected me was a mystery, a part of the house's history that had come to life in the darkest of moments. As time passed, the sense of unease in the old house began to fade, replaced by a feeling of reverence for the guardian that had watched over it for generations. The creak of the front door echoed through the empty house as my parents departed for a weekend getaway, leaving my sister, Emily, and me alone. At 17, I was no stranger to spending time on my own. I turned to Emily, who was 12, and tried to muster a reassuring smile. It's just the two of us this weekend, Em. We've got the whole house to ourselves. She nodded, her eyes wide with a mix of excitement and trepidation. Yeah, but it's kind of creepy when it's so quiet. I couldn't argue with her. The silence in the house was overwhelming, a heavy presence that seemed to settle in every corner. I told myself it was the absence of our parents that made the house seem so much larger and emptier than usual. We had our dinner in the cozy kitchen, chatting about school and life, doing our best to chase away the unease. But no matter how much we talked, the silence of the house lingered in the background, like a watchful spirit. After dinner, I suggested we watch a movie to distract ourselves from the disconcerting atmosphere. We settled on a comedy, and Emily's laughter filled the room as the characters on the screen stumbled through their ridiculous antics. It was a welcome distraction, but even as we laughed, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were not alone. The movie ended and Emily stifled a yawn. I'm heading to bed, you coming? I shook my head. I'll join you later. Just going to check things out downstairs first. She gave me a worried look but didn't protest. With a quick good night, she headed upstairs, leaving me alone in the dimly lit living room. The house seemed to creak and groan as I moved through it, its age and weight pressing down on me. The silence was so profound that it felt as though it was closing in, squeezing the very air from the room. I took a deep breath and tried to shake off the feeling of dread. As I passed the hallway leading to the basement, I heard a faint sound, like a whisper carried on the wind. I paused, my heart racing, straining to hear more. But the house remained still, as though it had swallowed the sound. Chalking it up to my imagination, I continued my exploration of the house. I made my way to the large, darkened living room, where heavy drapes blocked out the moonlight. I switched on the overhead light, dispelling some of the darkness that clung to the room. The furniture was old, relics from a different time, and the room held a sense of history that was both fascinating and unsettling. I'd heard stories of past occupants, tales of love and loss, of joy and sorrow, and sometimes it felt as though those stories were imprinted on the very walls. I moved to the bookshelves that lined one wall, running my fingers over the spines of old books and photo albums. As I leafed through one album, I came across a series of faded photographs, they depicted a family, a couple with two children and a house that looked strikingly similar to the one I now lived in. There was something haunting about those photographs, a sense of familiarity and yet a gnawing discomfort. The faces in the photographs were unfamiliar, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they were somehow connected to the house, as though the past had reached out to touch the present. With a shiver, I closed the album and returned it to the shelf. The room had grown colder and I could feel the presence of the past, lingering like a shadow in the corners. I decided it was time to head upstairs and join Emily. The heavy silence of the house had grown oppressive and the stories of the past were pressing in on me. As I climbed the stairs I could have sworn I heard a faint whisper behind me, a voice carried on the wind, but when I turned there was nothing there. 
I joined Emily in our shared bedroom, the dim glow of her nightlight casting dark shadows on the walls. She was already asleep, her breathing soft and steady. I climbed into my own bed, trying to put the unsettling feeling of the house behind me. But the night brought no solace. As I lay in the darkness, I couldn't escape the feeling of being watched. The room seemed to pulse with an unsettling energy, and I could hear the soft rustling of fabric and the gentle creak of floorboards, as if someone were moving through the house. Hours passed, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was not alone in the room. I turned to look at Emily, half expecting to see a figure lurking in the shadows. But there was nothing there, and my unease only deepened. I decided to check on the source of the sounds, telling myself that it was probably just the old house settling. I climbed out of bed and made my way to the hallway. The darkness was thick, like a shroud, and I moved cautiously, guided only by the faint moonlight filtering through the windows. As I descended the stairs, the sounds grew louder, more distinct. It was as though the house had come to life, its walls murmuring secrets that had been long buried. I followed the sounds to the living room, where the overhead light flickered to life, casting a creepy glow on the room. And there in the center of the room I saw her, a young girl, no older than Emily, with long dark hair and eyes that held a haunting sadness. She was dressed in an old-fashioned nightgown, her feet bare and dirty. She looked at me with a mixture of fear and longing, as though she had been waiting for someone to finally see her. My heart raced as I took in the sight of the ghostly figure before me. I had heard the stories, tales of a young girl who had lived in the house long ago and had vanished without a trace. It was said that she had never left the house, that her spirit still lingered in the dark corners, searching for something lost. I couldn't move, couldn't breathe, as the young girl reached out a hand toward me, her fingers trembling. And then, with a soft, plaintive whisper, she spoke. Help me. The sound was barely audible, a faint echo in the night, but it gave me a scary feeling. I knew I had to do something, to find out what had happened to this lost soul, to help her find peace. But as I took a step toward her, she faded away, dissolving into the shadows. The house fell silent once more, the only sound the thudding of my own heart. I returned to my room, my mind racing with questions and fear. The young girl's presence had shaken me to my core, and I couldn't escape the feeling that her story was entwined with the history of the house. Morning came, and I told Emily about the ghostly encounter. She listened with wide eyes, her fear mirrored in my own. We decided to investigate the history of the house, hoping to uncover the mystery of the young girl and the stories that had been passed down through generations. Our research revealed a tragic tale. The young girl named Isabella had lived in the house with her family in the late 1800s. She had vanished one fateful night, leaving her family in despair. Despite extensive searches, she was never found, and her disappearance had remained a haunting mystery. As we delved deeper into the history, we learned that the house had passed through various owners over the years, and each had their own stories of unexplained phenomena and ghostly encounters. It seemed that Isabella's spirit had remained in the house, searching for answers and perhaps someone who could finally help her find peace. Determined to uncover the truth, we embarked on a quest to find out what had happened to Isabella. We scoured old records, visited local archives, and even interviewed descendants of past owners. Slowly, we pieced together a narrative of a family torn apart by tragedy, a series of secrets and the mystery of a lost girl who had never found her way home. As we delved deeper into the past, we began to experience more encounters with Isabella's ghost. She appeared to us at night, her presence both scary and heart-wrenching. She would speak in soft, mournful whispers, imploring us to help her, to uncover the truth of what had happened on that fateful night so long ago. We couldn't deny her plea, and our determination to unravel the mystery only grew stronger. Together, we combed through the old attic, searching for clues that had remained hidden for generations. And then, as we sifted through dusty boxes and tattered letters, we made a discovery that scent creeped me out. Hidden beneath a pile of old photographs, we found a letter, its pages yellowed with age. It was a letter from Isabella to her parents, written on the night of her disappearance. In it, she revealed a secret, a forbidden love that had torn her family apart. As we read the letter, it became clear that Isabella had run away from home, unable to bear the pain of her family's disapproval. 
She had hoped to find her true love and start a new life, but fate had other plans. The letter ended abruptly with no indication of what had happened to her. Armed with this new information, we continued our investigation, determined to uncover the full story of Isabella's disappearance. We tracked down old family records and discovered that she had indeed run away, eloping with her love, a poor artist from a neighboring town. Their love had been forbidden and their families had disowned them. Isabella and her love had struggled to make a life together, but tragedy had struck. They had been separated and Isabella had vanished without a trace. Our research led us to a small forgotten cemetery on the outskirts of town, where we found the final piece of the puzzle. Isabella's grave, a simple weathered headstone marked her resting place. The date of her death was the same as the night she had disappeared. With heavy hearts, we realized that Isabella's ghost had been searching for closure, for someone to uncover the truth of her story. We had brought her one step closer to finding peace, but her presence in the house had not yet faded. We decided to hold a small private ceremony at Isabella's grave, a gesture of remembrance and closure. As we stood by her headstone, the air grew heavy and we felt the weight of the past. Emily and I said our goodbyes to Isabella, thanking her for the lessons she had taught us about love, loss, and the enduring power of the human spirit. That night, as we returned to the house, we felt a profound sense of peace. Isabella's ghost, it seemed, had found the closure she had longed for, and the house was no longer filled with the haunting presence of the past. In the years that followed, the old house became a place of warmth and comfort, a sanctuary for our family. I sat alone in our old family home, the soft ticking of the antique clock on the wall the only sound to break the heavy silence. My parents had left for a week-long business trip, and I had volunteered to take care of our aging dog, Max, while they were away. I was 16 and spending a week on my own wasn't new to me, but as the evening sun dipped below the horizon and shadows stretched across the rooms, a feeling of unease crept in. The house, built in the early 1900s, bore the weight of its history, and every creak and groan seemed to carry with it a whisper of the past. Max, an old and arthritic Labrador, lay at my feet. His presence was comforting, a reminder of the familiar in this sea of uncertainty. I stroked his graying fur, my fingers finding solace in the soft rhythm of his breath. The first night alone in the house felt oddly disquieting. I made a simple dinner, and as I ate, the empty chairs around the dining table seemed to watch me, their emptiness unsettling. I turned on some music, hoping to drown out the silence, but it only seemed to echo through the empty rooms. After dinner, I took Max for a short walk in the garden the chilly evening air offering a welcome break from the stifling quiet of the house. As we made our way back inside, the soft rustling of leaves in the garden seemed to carry secrets of their own. I shook off the feeling of unease and closed the door, locking it securely behind us. The evening passed uneventfully and I settled in the living room to watch a movie. The flickering light from the screen cast shifting shadows across the walls, and for a moment I felt as if the house were holding its breath. I brushed the feeling aside and tried to immerse myself in the film. As the movie ended and the room plunged into darkness, I realized that it was time to head to bed. Max followed me upstairs, his slow, deliberate steps echoing through the hallway. The house was silent, and as I climbed into bed I couldn't help but feel as though I were being watched. Sleep was elusive, and the silence seemed to grow heavier with each passing moment. I tossed and turned my thoughts racing through the labyrinth of the dark. The old house felt like a living, breathing entity, its walls listening to secrets long buried. Then, in the stillness of the night, a sound broke through, a soft, rhythmic tapping, like a finger gently rapping on a window pane. I listened intently, straining to locate the source of the sound. It was persistent, almost like a distant melody, and it seemed to be coming from somewhere within the house. As I slipped out of bed, Max's eyes followed me, his gaze filled with a mixture of curiosity and apprehension. The tapping grew louder and I moved through the hallway, trying to pinpoint its origin. It was as if the very walls were murmuring, carrying with them a haunting melody. I reached the top of the stairs and followed the sound down to the living room. The tapping led me to the large bay window that overlooked the garden. I gazed outside, my breath catching in my throat as I saw what had been making the sound. A gnarled tree branch swaying in the wind and brushing against the glass. 
Relief washed over me and I laughed at my own jittery nerves. It was just a tree branch, a trick of the wind, but in the stillness of the house it had taken on an eerie presence. I made a mental note to trim the branch the next day and return to bed. Max followed me and with his reassuring presence I gradually drifted off to sleep. The house settled into an uneasy quiet and I thought I could hear the faint echoes of footsteps in the dark, but I brushed it off as the stuff of dreams. The following day I busied myself with chores around the house. I cleaned the rooms, trimmed the overgrown hedges in the garden, and even tackled the chore of trimming the troublesome tree branch outside the living room window. The sunlight cast long, comforting shadows across the property, and for a moment, the unease of the night before seemed like a distant memory. As the day turned into evening, I settled in the living room with Max, watching TV. The laughter of the characters on the screen was a comforting contrast to the silence of the house. I had almost forgotten the strange events of the previous night when the tapping sound returned. It was just as rhythmic and insistent as before, and this time I couldn't deny the feeling that it was coming from within the house. I muted the television and listened carefully, trying to locate the source of the sound. Max, too, lifted his head, his ears perked in the direction of the living room window. The tapping seemed to grow louder, more urgent, and I realized it was coming from the basement. I had never been particularly fond of the basement, with its old creaky stairs and dimly lit corners, but I couldn't ignore the persistent sound. With Max at my side, I made my way to the basement door, my heart pounding in my chest. The silence in the house had turned oppressive, and the tapping seemed to be a defiant challenge to that silence. I took a deep breath and descended into the dimly lit basement. The tapping grew louder as I reached the bottom of the stairs, and my eyes were drawn to a small narrow window set high in the basement wall. The window was covered by a tattered curtain, its fabric moving gently in the breeze. And as I approached, I realized that the tapping sound was the curtain brushing against the window frame. Relief washed over me and I chuckled at my own jittery nerves. It was just the wind, the same wind that had caused the tree branch to tap against the living room window the night before. I made a mental note to secure the curtain and headed back upstairs with Max. That night I settled into bed with Max at my side, trying to shake off the lingering unease from the previous nights. Sleep once again proved elusive, the silence of the house pressing in on me. I listened to the soft sound of Max's breathing, grateful for his presence. Just as I began to drift off, a sound broke through the stillness, a low, mournful howl. I sat up in bed, my heart racing. It was Max, his head tilted back, his eyes filled with a mixture of fear and confusion. The howl was not his own, but it seemed to be coming from somewhere within the house. I called out to Max, trying to calm him, but his howling continued. I could feel the unease from the previous night's returning and the house seemed to pulse with an unsettling energy. I knew I had to investigate the source of the sound. With Max following closely, I made my way downstairs, my unease growing with each step. The howling was louder now, echoing through the house like a mournful lament. It seemed to be coming from the basement once again. I reached the basement door and descended the stairs, the howling growing more distinct. It was as though the sound was beckoning me, pulling me deeper into the darkness. I reached the basement window, the same one where I had discovered the tapping curtain the night before. But this time the curtain was still and the window was closed. The howling continued, its source elusive. I could feel Max's distress, his eyes fixed on the dark corners of the basement, as though he could sense something I couldn't. I called out once more, trying to calm Max and to dispel the unease that had settled over me. And then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the howling ceased. The house fell into silence once more, the only sound the soft ticking of the antique clock on the wall. I retreated from the basement, Max at my side, a sense of foreboding settling over me. I couldn't explain the source of the howling, but it was clear that the old house held mysteries that extended beyond its walls. As I climbed back into bed, I couldn't escape the feeling that the house itself was trying to communicate with me, Morning came and I decided to delve into the history of the house, hoping to uncover the mysteries that seemed to be lurking within its walls. I learned that the house had been built in the early 1900s by a prominent family, but their history was shrouded in secrecy. As I delved deeper, I uncovered a newspaper article from the early 1920s. The article described a tragic event, a fire that had claimed the lives of the family who had built the house. 
The fire had been a mystery, its cause never determined, and it had left the house empty and abandoned for years. I couldn't ignore the feeling of unease that settled over me as I read the article. It was as though the events of the past were reaching out to touch the present, their stories carried on the wind, in the tapping of branches and in the mournful howling that had filled the house. I decided to explore the basement once more, convinced that it held the key to the mysteries of the house. As I descended the stairs, the unease in the air grew heavier, and the basement seemed to shift and contort as though it were a place of secrets long buried. I made my way to the narrow window, the same one where I had discovered the tapping curtain. But this time as I approached, I noticed something strange, a soft ghostly figure that seemed to be standing just beyond the glass. The figure was indistinct, its features blurred, and it was difficult to make out any details. But there was no denying the sense of a presence, a silent observer who had been watching from the shadows. With trepidation, I reached for the curtain, pulling it aside to reveal the basement window. The figure remained, its eyes fixed on me, and for a moment I felt as though I were looking into the past, into a world that had long since vanished. The figure's eyes held a haunting sadness, a plea for understanding and it seemed to be reaching out to me, trying to convey a message. I couldn't explain the presence of the figure, but it was clear that it was connected to the mysteries of the house. As I watched, the figure slowly faded away, dissipating into the darkness. The house seemed to breathe a sigh of relief, and the unease that had settled over it began to lift. I returned to my room, my mind racing with questions and fear. The figure in the basement had shown me that the house held secrets that extended beyond its walls, that its history was a tapestry of tragedy and loss. And as I watched the sunrise from my bedroom window, I couldn't help but feel that the house was not just a structure, but a living entity, a repository of stories that were waiting to be uncovered. In the days that followed, I continued my research into the history of the house, determined to uncover the secrets that had long been buried. The figure in the basement had been a messenger, a reminder that the past could not be forgotten, that the stories of those who had lived in the house were still waiting to be told. As I uncovered more of the house's history, I realized that it was a place of both darkness and light, a sanctuary for the lost and a repository of the past. The mysteries of the house had become a part of my own story, a testament to the enduring power of history and the importance of uncovering the truth. Moving to the bustling city was a dream I had harbored since my childhood in the quiet countryside. The opportunity finally arrived when I secured a job in the heart of the metropolis. I found a cozy apartment on the seventh floor of an old building, and the city's vibrant energy flowed through its veins. I had anticipated many challenges, but what awaited me in the apartment below was beyond my wildest imagination. The first few weeks in the city were a whirlwind of excitement. I was awestruck by the towering skyscrapers, the endless stream of people, and the ceaseless hum of life. My apartment was a haven of tranquility, and I often spent my evenings on the balcony, gazing at the city lights below. It was during one such evening that I first noticed the peculiar occurrences. A muffled sound like distant whispers seemed to rise from the apartment below mine. At first I dismissed it as a figment of my imagination the city's symphony playing tricks on my senses. However, the sounds persisted, growing more distinct each night. I couldn't help but wonder about the neighbors who resided in the apartment below. They were a mystery to me, as I had not yet met them, and the apartment's occupant had recently moved in, just like me. The sounds emanating from below were a peculiar mix of hushed conversations, muffled laughter, and occasional crying. It was as if the inhabitants of the apartment were engaged in a perpetual state of discussion, never raising their voices, but their conversations were impossible to ignore. One evening, as I leaned over my balcony railing, trying to identify the source of the sounds, I spotted a dim light emanating from the window below. A faint glow painted the curtains in shades of amber, and the silhouette of a person could be seen moving in the room. The sight piqued my curiosity. The following day, I decided to introduce myself to the new neighbors. I approached their door, my knuckles rapping against the wood. No response. I knocked once more with the same result. It was as if the apartment had been abandoned. 
Perplexed, I inquired with other tenants in the building about the inhabitants of the apartment below. No one seemed to know them, and they too mentioned hearing the odd sounds, like the ghostly echoes of conversations. The mystery deepened. Each night as the city below transformed into a glowing labyrinth, the strange occurrences in the apartment below continued. The hushed voices persisted, and sometimes I would catch a glimpse of shadowy figures moving within. It was clear that someone was living there, but they chose to remain hidden from the world. As weeks turned into months, my unease grew. I contemplated reporting the matter to the building's management, but I had no evidence of any wrongdoing. The whisperings, however unsettling, did not constitute a crime. One evening, while I was trying to unravel the mystery, I noticed something peculiar. The lights from the apartment below had grown dim, their glow flickering like a fading ember. The hushed conversations had ceased and in silence filled the space. The change was unnerving, and it was as if the apartment had become a void. I couldn't help but wonder what had transpired within its walls. In the following days, I became increasingly anxious. The apartment below remained shrouded in darkness, and the whispers had given way to a silence that seemed to stretch into eternity. Unable to bear the tension any longer, I decided to involve the building management. The superintendent, Mr. Dawson, listened to my concerns and promised to investigate the matter. He assured me that he would pay a visit to the apartment and try to identify the tenants. Days passed and I anxiously awaited an update from Mr. Dawson. However, the information he provided only deepened my disquiet. When he had approached the apartment below, he found the door locked and no one answered his knocks. Peering through the windows, he saw that the apartment was empty, devoid of any furniture or personal belongings. The situation had grown increasingly bizarre. The apartment below remained uninhabited, yet the odd sounds continued to emanate from it, as if it held secrets that defied explanation. One evening, as I once again gazed at the window of the enigmatic apartment, I saw something that made my blood turn cold. The curtains had been drawn back and the room was bathed in an eerie, pulsating light. I could see shadowy figures moving within, their movements erratic and unnatural. I watched in horrified fascination as the figures seemed to writhe and twist, their forms morphing into grotesque shapes. It was a nightmarish spectacle that defied all reason. The apartment had become a place of unimaginable horror, a dark anomaly within the building. Terrified, I contacted the police explaining the strange occurrences and the unsettling events that had transpired within the apartment below. The officers arrived promptly and I led them to the apartment. When they attempted to open the door, they found it unlocked, as if someone had recently left. The apartment was in disarray, furniture overturned, and the walls adorned with strange symbols. It was a scene of chaos and madness. The officers conducted a thorough search, but they found no one inside. It was as if the apartment had been abandoned in a hurry, its occupants vanishing into thin air. The mystery of the apartment below remained unsolved, and it left me with a sense of dread that would haunt me for years to come. The building's tenants whispered about the start events, their voices filled with uncertainty and fear. No one could explain the inexplicable, the bizarre occurrences in the apartment that defied all reason. The whisperings, the creepy light, and the unsettling figures continued to linger in the minds of those who had witnessed them. A chilling reminder that some mysteries are never meant to be unraveled. The end. Second story begins. The neighborhood of Green Valley was a serene, picturesque place, known for its charming houses and friendly residents. It was the kind of place where everyone knew everyone else and a feeling of safety and community pervaded the streets. But as with any seemingly idyllic neighborhood, there was a darker side that lurked beneath the surface. My wife, Emily, and I had recently moved to Green Valley in search of a peaceful life away from the chaos of the city. We were delighted with our new home, a cozy two-story house with a white picket fence that bordered a small but well-maintained garden. As we settled into our new life, we made an effort to get to know our neighbors. They welcomed us with open arms, inviting us over for dinner and neighborhood gatherings. But there was one resident, a man named Edward Montgomery who lived two houses down that remained a mystery. Edward was a reclusive figure who rarely participated in neighborhood events. Despite our attempts to be friendly, he always seemed to find a reason to avoid us. Emily would often joke that he was the neighborhood enigma, a title that stuck. 
The rumors about Edward began to circulate among the neighbors. Some said he was a retired detective. Others whispered that he had a troubled past, but no one knew the truth. It was this shroud of secrecy that made him all the more intriguing. The first sign that something was amiss occurred one summer evening. Emily and I were enjoying a glass of wine on our front porch when we spotted Edward for the first time. He was standing in his front yard staring at our house, his eyes hidden behind a pair of dark sunglasses. Emily nudged me and whispered, Isn't that Edward? I nodded, unable to shake the unease that had settled within me. He stood there unblinking, as if he were studying our every move. It was as if he were assessing us, sizing us up, but for what purpose I couldn't fathom. Over the coming weeks, we would often catch glimpses of Edward from our porch. He would stand at his window, gazing out into the street, or sit in his car for hours on end, watching our house. It was as if he were a silent sentinel guarding a secret we were not privy to. Emily and I would often discuss our neighbor's behavior in hushed tones. It was clear that there was something unusual about Edward, and we couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. One evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and cast long shadows across the neighborhood, I decided to pay Edward a visit. It was an attempt to bridge the gap, to understand the man who had remained such an enigma. I approached his house and knocked on the front door, but there was no response. I could hear the faint sound of a television from within, but it was as if Edward had simply disappeared. I left a friendly note with my contact information and decided to give him some space. Days turned into weeks and Edward's behavior only grew more peculiar. He would stand at his window sometimes in the middle of the night, and we would often catch him watching our house through his binoculars. It was as if he were always vigilant, always observing. Emily, who had always been the more cautious of the two of us, grew increasingly concerned. She suggested we contact the authorities, but I couldn't shake the feeling that there had to be a rational explanation for Edward's behavior. Perhaps he was a lonely old man, a recluse who had grown accustomed to his own habits. But one night everything changed. It was a particularly cold evening and Emily and I were bundled up on the couch watching television. The room was bathed in a soft, warm light and we felt safe and secure within the walls of our home. As we chatted and laughed, I happened to glance out the window. What I saw sent a shiver down my spine. Edward was standing in our front yard, illuminated by the dim glow of the street lamp. He held something in his hand and I could see that it was a photograph of us, a picture taken through our living room window. I sprang to my feet, my heart racing and flung the front door open. I shouted at Edward, demanding an explanation for his intrusion. He didn't respond but simply turned and walked away, disappearing into the darkness. I was seething with anger and fear. Emily and I decided that it was finally time to contact the authorities. We provided them with a detailed account of Edward's unsettling behavior, including the incident with the photograph. The police assured us that they would look into the matter, but in the days that followed, our anxiety only grew. The presence of Edward had cast a long, dark shadow over our lives and the feeling of being constantly watched had become a haunting reality. A few weeks passed and the police informed us that they had questioned Edward about the photograph. He had explained it away as a simple misunderstanding, a mistake, and there was no concrete evidence to suggest otherwise. The authorities could do little more and we were left feeling vulnerable and exposed. One evening, as Emily and I sat on our porch, we spotted Edward standing near his fence staring at us with an intensity that sent a chill down our spines. His gaze was unwavering, and it was as if he were trying to convey a message, though we couldn't discern its meaning. I stood up, unable to bear the sense of unease any longer, and approached Edward. What do you want from us? I demanded. He remained silent for a moment, and then, in a voice that was both chilling and earnest, he whispered, I'm trying to protect you. Protect us from what? Edward hesitated, his gaze never leaving us, and then he said, You don't understand. They're watching, always watching. We have to be careful, you see. The truth is out there, and we must protect it. I couldn't make sense of his words, and I realized that he had succumbed to his delusions, that his obsession with surveillance had led him down a dark and twisted path. Emily tugged at my arm, urging me to return to the safety of our porch, and as we retreated, Edward's gaze followed us, haunting and unrelenting. Days turned into weeks and the sense of being constantly watched only grew more oppressive. 
We knew that we had to protect ourselves to take control of our own lives. We installed security cameras, changed the locks on our doors, and did everything we could to regain our sense of security. But one evening, as we sat in our living room, the power suddenly went out. It was a stormy night and we could hear the howling wind outside. Emily and I exchanged worried glances and I grabbed a flashlight, determined to investigate the cause of the outage. As I ventured into the darkened hallway, I heard a sound that sent a jolt of fear coursing through me. It was a voice, soft and cold, that seemed to emanate from the shadows. You shouldn't have tried to escape. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest, and I shone the flashlight into the hallway. There, standing in the shadows, was Edward. His eyes were filled with a malevolent gleam, and he held a knife in his hand. Emily's scream pierced the darkness, and I could hear her struggling in the living room. I rushed back, but it was too late. Edward had attacked her, and she lay on the floor, blood pooling around her. I grabbed the nearest object I could find and swung it at Edward, hitting him in the head. He crumpled to the ground and I rushed to Emily's side, my hands trembling as I tried to stem the bleeding. The police arrived shortly after and Edward was taken into custody. He was charged with attempted murder and the truth about his obsession with surveillance and his delusions finally came to light. Emily survived the attack, but the scars, both physical and emotional, would never truly heal. Our peaceful life in Green Valley had been shattered, and the feeling of being watched had left us forever changed. Eager for an adventure off the beaten path, Tom and his friends embarked on a road trip through the remote countryside of Eastern Europe. They had heard rumors of a hidden village called Gavroska, untouched by modern civilization. After hours of driving, they stumbled upon the village nestled in a picturesque valley. Its inhabitants, dressed in traditional attire, welcomed the travelers with open arms. The village seemed idyllic, frozen in time. As they explored, Tom and his friends noticed peculiarities the villagers' insistence on not mentioning the modern world, the absence of any technology, and the eerie quiet that pervaded the village. On the second day, they awoke to find the village deserted. Panic set in as they searched for any sign of life, but there was none. They decided to leave, but discovered their car had vanished. Trapped in Gavraska, they delved deeper into the mystery. Hidden in a cellar, they uncovered a journal from the 1800s that told of a curse placed upon the village a curse that trapped its inhabitants in a timeless purgatory. With each passing day, Tom and his friends felt time slip away, their own bodies aging while the village remained untouched. Desperate, they sought a way to break the curse. Their research led them to a hidden chamber beneath the village church where they discovered a decrepit altar. There, they performed a solemn ritual to appease the ancient curse, offering their own time and memories in exchange for the village's freedom. The village came alive once more, but Tom and his friends aged decades in an instant, their memories fading like mist. They were old, their lives reduced to fragments of time, but they had succeeded. The curse of Gavraska was lifted and the village was free. Tom was the only one who survived, a frail old man with only fleeting memories of his youth and friends. He would never forget the sacrifice that had set the village free, a sacrifice that had come at a great personal cost. For their annual adventure, a group of college friends decided to explore the Appalachian Mountains, known for their rugged terrain and hidden secrets. Their destination was a remote cave, rumored to hold ancient treasures. As they ventured into the cave, the air grew chilly and the darkness pressed in around them. Illuminating the path with flashlights, they navigated the labyrinthine tunnels, uncovering eerie carvings on the walls. Deeper within the cave, they discovered a chamber unlike any other, an underground lake its waters shimmering with an unnatural glow. The sight was breathtaking, but the tranquility was short-lived. A shadowy figure emerged from the water, its eyes gleaming with malevolence. It spoke not with words, but with images in their minds, a warning to leave, for the cave was cursed. Fearful yet curious, the friends pressed on, desperate to uncover the cave's secrets. As they delved deeper, the shadows grew thicker and their flashlights flickered. One by one, they vanished, consumed by the darkness. Only Sarah remained, her heart pounding as she tried to escape. But the cave seemed to shift and twist, trapping her within its depths. 
Finally, she reached the underground lake where the shadowy figure awaited. It revealed its true form, a guardian spirit tasked with protecting the cave's ancient secrets. With sorrow in its eyes, the guardian explained that the cave held the memories of those who had entered, bound for all eternity. The friends had become one with the cave, their souls imprisoned within its depths. Sarah, alone and terrified, realized that there was no escape. She had uncovered the cave's dark secret, but it had come at a terrible price. As she gazed into the glowing waters, she knew that she would join her friends in the shadows, a part of the cave's cursed legacy. Roanoke Island, with its rich history and maritime legends, drew tourists seeking adventure. A group of friends set out to explore the coastal town, eager to uncover the mysteries hidden within its shores. As they wandered the historic waterfront, they stumbled upon a dilapidated ship, its timbers rotting and sails tattered. The locals spoke of the ship as cursed, the Phantom Voyager, a vessel that had vanished without a trace centuries ago. Undeterred by the superstitions, the friends boarded the ship, armed with cameras and a sense of curiosity. They explored its eerie corridors and abandoned cabins, documenting their findings. As night fell, a thick fog enveloped the ship, cutting off their view of the shore. Panic set in as they realized they were trapped on the ghostly vessel. Desperate, they tried to signal for help, but their cries went unanswered. Strange occurrences plagued them. The sound of ghostly footsteps, whispers in the dark, and apparitions that seemed to flicker in and out of existence. The friends grew increasingly frightened, their unity crumbling. One by one, they vanished, consumed by the ship's supernatural forces. Only Alex remained, his heart pounding as he tried to make sense of the nightmare that had become his reality. In the ghostly silence, Alex stumbled upon a journal hidden in the captain's quarters. It revealed the ship's dark history, the captain's pact with a vengeful sea spirit, offering the souls of his crew in exchange for eternal life. The Phantom Voyager had become a floating prison, a vessel bound by dark magic to claim the souls of those who dared to step aboard. Alex understood that the ship could never be free until its curse was broken. With grim determination, he confronted the Sea Spirit, offering his own soul in exchange for the release of the ship and the trapped souls within. The Spirit, its eyes filled with malevolence, accepted the offer, and the ship faded into the mist. Alex was left alone on the fog-shrouded waters, a survivor of the ghostly ordeal. He watched as the Phantom Voyager vanished from sight, knowing that his sacrifice had set the trapped souls free, but had come at a terrible cost. Angkor Wat, the famous temple complex in Cambodia, was a must-visit for tourists worldwide. Mark and his friends, avid urban explorers, decided to explore not just the main temple, but also the less known ruins nearby. The group had heard whispers of the temple's dark past, horrifying experiments, cruel treatment of patients, and rumors of restless spirits. Determined to document their adventure, they brought cameras, flashlights, and a sense of dread that clung to them like a second skin. As they entered the decaying building, the stench of mildew and decay assaulted their senses. Crumbling walls, shattered windows, and discarded hospital equipment painted a grim picture of what had transpired within these walls. The exploration was unnerving, but nothing could prepare them for what they discovered in the basement. Rows of rusted cages, restraints, and a chillingly preserved operating room told a haunting tale of suffering. Sarah's friend Jake couldn't resist trying on an old straitjacket for a photo. As he posed, a deafening crash echoed through the basement. The group frantically searched for the source of the noise, but found nothing. Their unease grew, and they decided to leave the basement. That's when they realized Jake was missing. Panic set in as they scoured the asylum, but there was no sign of him. Terrified and hearts pounding, they fled the asylum, vowing to return with help. The police were called, and a search of the building commenced. But Jake was never found. In the following weeks, the group reviewed their photos, hoping for clues. In one, they saw Jake straitjacketed, surrounded by shadowy figures with hollow eyes. His fate remained a mystery, but the chilling photograph served as a haunting reminder of their ill-fated exploration. As time passed, the group's obsession with Jake's disappearance grew. 
They delve deeper into the history of the asylum, uncovering tales of a doctor who had conducted grotesque experiments on patients, leaving them scarred both physically and mentally. One evening, Sarah received an anonymous email with a cryptic message, coordinates leading to an abandoned mansion on the outskirts of town. Intrigued and driven by the need for closure, the group decided to investigate. The mansion, hidden behind overgrown trees and crumbling stone walls, exuded an air of malevolence. As they entered, they discovered a room filled with disturbing photographs and journals detailing the doctor's experiments. The truth unfolded before their eyes. Jake had become a victim of the asylum's dark past. He had been subjected to torturous procedures, his mind shattered by the doctor's sadistic pursuits. As they continued to explore, they stumbled upon a hidden chamber deep within the mansion. Inside, they found Jake, his emaciated body suspended from the ceiling by chains. His eyes, once vibrant, now held only emptiness. With trembling hands, they released Jake from his nightmarish prison. His reunion with Sarah was bittersweet, as the horrors he had endured left him a shell of his former self. The group vowed to bring the doctor's atrocities to light, to ensure that no one else would suffer the same fate. But as they left the mansion, they couldn't shake the feeling that the darkness of the asylum still clung to them, a haunting reminder of the evil they had uncovered. Nestled deep in the Appalachian Mountains, Whispering Pines Inn was known for its rustic charm and breathtaking views. Sarah and her husband Mark decided to spend their anniversary there, eager to escape the hustle and bustle of city life. The innkeeper, Mr. Simmons, welcomed them warmly and showed them to their room, a quaint antique-filled suite with a balcony overlooking the dense forest. Their first night was peaceful, but on the second night Sarah was awakened by a soft, mournful whisper that seemed to emanate from the walls themselves. She roused Mark, but he heard nothing and dismissed it as a dream. The whispers grew louder each night, accompanied by a feeling of icy dread that seemed to seep into their bones. Sarah's sleepless nights left her exhausted, and Mark's skepticism slowly eroded. One evening as they sat on the balcony, a chilling voice spoke directly into their minds. Leave this place before it claims you, it warned. They glanced around, but there was no one to be seen. Terrified, they packed their bags and sought out Mr. Simmons. As they approached the innkeeper's office, they noticed a portrait on the wall, an eerie painting of Mr. Simmons himself, his eyes cold and lifeless. And Mr. Simmons explained that he had been bound to the inn by a dark pact made long ago, and the inn demanded souls to sustain it. He had lured countless guests to their doom, and he was bound to do so for eternity. With a heavy heart, Mr. Simmons urged them to run to save themselves from the inn's insatiable hunger. Sarah and Mark fled, leaving behind the cursed Whispering Pines Inn and its malevolent innkeeper. They sought refuge in a nearby town, haunted by the memories of their ordeal. The whispers and icy dread had left scars on their souls, a constant reminder of the evil that had lurked within the inn's walls. Years later, as they passed by the inn, they saw that it had fallen into further disrepair, its once charming exterior now a decrepit facade. They knew that the innkeeper's curse would forever bind him to the crumbling building, a prisoner of his own malevolence. 